So you actually thought you started the recording like two minutes ago? No. No, I didn't. That's why I said I was going to, and then I left the microphone away from my mouth. You're just... I mean... I project, but I project. Mean, I have the bad microphone, so I need to get right up on this. You deject. I do... I am... I am dejected on a daily basis. <laughs> that, is, that is for damn sure. <laughs> Anywho... Uh, first things first, of course, Wizards of the Coast would be like Dungeon Bros, more like, more like Bungeon Dros, am I right? Got him. And then, and then post a uh, 1D, drop a 1D&D playtest the day we post the podcast. Literally the, yeah. Day after. So. We would, if we had, had we known. Had we known. We might have delayed it. We, we, yeah, we, absolutely. But we, could, we could have been on the cutting edge. Yeah. Literally, they dropped the introduction video the day before it came out, and it dropped like a half hour after the podcast posted. Yeah. I was furious. I was I was going to throw some hands at Jeremy Crawford. Um, well, fortunately for him, he it's did, a really long drive. He did not catch these hands because <laughs> I didn't throw them very well. Um, how, how you been? Tired. Tired? Always tired. Constantly tired? Just just ever so often. Probably it's not good because I've been staying up late playing Risk of Rain 2 with Andy mm. the past like mm-hmm. week. Mm-hmm. 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 That's why I'm playing a lot of Hollow Knight. A lot of Hollow Knight. A lot of Hollow Knight. It's a fun little platformer. I have been spending most of my free time uh, collecting all of the Magic the Gathering cards that I have and creating another commander deck. Yes, you've been... So we've been doing much research. I even I even bought some singles to upgrade my Edgar the Charmed Groom from Crimson Vow. Now, he's no Edgar Markov. OG. Red, white, and black commander. That guy's fucking ridiculous. And he's eighty five dollars. So I'm not getting it. Yeah, him. that's that the ridiculousness and the price point kinda go together. I think I got twenty I think I got twenty cards to add to this for like twenty bucks. That's pretty good. A couple of them are tokens because I want nice tokens. And you know, I, I'm 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 proud of this. But not this Friday as of we are recording, Correct. but the coming Friday as of the posting of this podcast is your birthday. Party. So your birthday party. And uh, we'll be playing a lot of Magic the Gathering. So I wanted a secondary commander deck. Just so if we were running some games commander, I could mix it up. I was hoping to, I was I was hoping to get one of the uh, precons um, from Warhammer, mm-hmm. the Necron specifically, because it more of more of like just to have another one uh, for next week. But then also like some of the cards are really good in a deck I want to build. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Went online when once I decided that I wanted to pre-order it. I went online. This was like a couple days ago, and. Uh, they're much more expensive than they were like a week ago. Yeah. It's weird. Certain commanders, like the, the commander precon for the original Edgar Markov in Commanders 2017, which by the way, we were not Magic the Gathering people when we started this podcast a year ago. No. But now, in the last month, two months, we're very Magic the Gathering people. Yeah, we've 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 <laughs> so, done everything we said we wouldn't. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> so the original Edgar Markov C- Commander Precon is like $350 now. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is we need to very closely look at the reviews of Commander Precons as they come out. And the underpowered ones we don't buy, but the ones that are strong we do buy and hope that they uh, go to the moon Dogecoin style. And at the very least, we have like some dual lands and some, some neat cards and some fun things to play with. There you go. Indeed. Indeed. Mm-hmm. I've been doing a weird thing. You do a lot of weird things. I've what? been playing D&D at work. Oh, yes. You, you, you started that recently. Yeah. Now, we're not. I, when I say playing D&D at work, I don't literally mean... Well, there was one session, but we... <laughs> A work D and D group, mm-hmm. and I'm having I'm having to go into the office building to play this D and D because we have people in the morning shift that are getting off the morning shift, and then people in the night shift that are coming in early, mm. and then the people in the morning shift are staying late, and then that's where the overlap happens. Sure, the overlap where we can play D and D. I'm not the DM. I'm a hunter ranger, mm-hmm. Ilvar Umavi. Yes, you were very, very, you've been very excited about playing him. I love him. I love him. Also, the bean just t- changed her sleeping position. And she is so derpy and adorable right now. 
<laughs> so cute. I wish I could show you. <laughs> I wish I could show you, Internet. Um, <laughs> Distracted. Anyway, we also played one session while I was working. Okay. Uh, which was just a joy to behold. Okay. In many ways. I don't because know you I didn't have to do your work. I mean, I did. I still had to do my work. Mm. I, my work requires me to pay attention to things. Uh, I work in television, and I was running master. Uh, I don't want to admit I was running <laughs> master control, <laughs> and uh, thankfully we were in a live sporting event that I had to roll a break every like forty five minutes. So as long as I like had the volume up and I was checking like in between stuff, mm-hmm. then it was fine. It was sure. totally fine. All right, perfect. Nothing went wrong. Everything was good. We had a good time. It's weird. I don't like going to work when I'm not working. Understandable. But I like playing D&D while I am working. So six one, half dozen the other. We'll figure it out. Anyway. See, I used to uh, run games. I worked at a brewery and I would run games at the brewery because it was a little like party room. I'd run games in there and then be like, all right, that's been, you know, we got here at noon, four hour game, four o'clock. Be like, all right, guys, have a drink if you want. I walk behind the bar. I clock in and we go. That's nice. That's nice. It's nice. That's a good time. That's a good time. Last week, we introduced a new segment to the podcast as well. The draft. Yes. In honor of the start of the fantasy football season and also our desire for a good bit. Uh, we made a D20 table that we're going to roll on here in a moment. Uh, but last week, we rolled board games and we, we each did. drafted uh, five board games. And then we put our picks up on our Instagram, Instagram page for people to vote on. And people are fucking stupid. No, no. No, no, they're great. People they're are stupid. geniuses. Uh, Sam's draft one. I did. Which is ludicrous. It's great. Ludicrous. Go me. Ludicrous. I played to the crowd. Sam. Ludicrous. <laughs> Sam drafted uh, the five board games Betrayal of House on the Hill. A good pick. Not a first round draft. Not a first round draft pick. I hold firm to that. You could have gotten in fifth round. Sorry. Go Fish. Value picks. Good spots. Munchkin. Another good value pick. And then. Either salad bowl or monikers, depending on where you are, where you're from, mm-hmm. what you call it. Yes. I picked the objectively better team of chess, the greatest game ever created. Monopoly, a classic board game that if you are playing it and it takes forever, you're playing it wrong with house rules. If you play it rules as written in the instruction manual, that's a 45 minute game. Just straight up. Anyway, Uno. Werewolf, and then our new beloved favorite, Red Dragon Mm. Inn. And Sam won, I believe, 56% of the vote. Uh, 54 to 46. Oh, closer. Closer even. So, you know, not everyone's a fucking idiot. Again, again, I think you were going, uh, uh, you're going too too highfalutin again. Our, our, our. Too highfalutin? Yeah, our, our group. It's a classic. It's an OG. And you know how many. Yeah, there are so many people that despise it for being chess. Same with Monopoly. Yeah, and people are dumb. And again, a lot of people who follow us on Instagram are very modern board gamers. That is that is the thing. You 100% knew the audience that yeah. would be voting, and um, I'm going to keep that in mind. So, well, before with we, that... No, we, we haven't done our intro. Oh, right. Yes. I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. And we are the Dungeon Bros. And we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. Though, some days it feels like it. Dungeon, dungeon of our own creation. You got to it first. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, with that, now uh, yeah, drafting time, huh? We're gonna take this. Uh, we're gonna take this Battle for Baldur's Gate D twenty that we got from Gen Con. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit oversized. It's not a spin down. We're nope. gonna roll. Two, two, two is candy. Candy, ooh. Two is candy. We are going to each be drafting five candies. Now we have some oversized D twenties here. This will determine. We're rolling initiative. Who is going to get the first overall draft pick? Ready. Ooh, six. Twelve. You go first, Twelve. again. Now, when it comes to candy, there's a couple different routes. Yes. But there are some objective realities when it comes to candy. One of these objective realities is that in and amongst the top two, three if you're really pushing it, but top two candies for most everyone Including myself. Hmm. Number one candy for me, personally. Asterisk, if you do not have a peanut allergy, is the Reese Cup. Yes. So my first draft pick will indeed be the Reese Cup. Yeah, that was uh, that was going to be whoever got that 
was going to, whoever got first was going to choose the Reese cup or Reese's cup whatever you want to fuck indeed now Obviously, we're not going to get into the minutia of the sub variants of the Reese cup. No, the, clearly the there is a better version of the Reese's tree for Christmas, the Reese's pumpkin for Halloween, the Reese's egg for Easter. Much better. Top tier. Much better. Indisputable champion. If if we're going head to head, if we were create, if we were doing March Madness style brackets, undisputed champion of the mm. world, the Reese's egg. Sam. <sighs> okay. Um, I think there are two very distinctive categories. You have the, the sugary fruit ones and you have the chocolate, um, almost more dessert than snack. Mm -hmm. I feel, Mm -hmm. uh, I think I will also stay in the chocolate. Um, and I'm going to just go with the Hershey's milk chocolate bar. The classic Hershey's milk chocolate. Classic. You know what? That's one of the first candy bars that a lot of kids get introduced to. I'm not a big milk chocolate fan, to be honest with you. Now, do we want to include the, since I mentioned the sub-variants of the Reese's Cup, I feel it only right to introduce the sub-variants of the Hershey's, the dark chocolate, the Hershey's with almonds, the Hershey's white chocolate. I think that the Reese's Cup, the the forms factor is what's the real difference there, and that causing a variation in the mm-hmm. in the mm-hmm. chocolate to peanut butter ratio, mm-hmm. with the different versions of light, milk, dark, white, all very different candies themselves. Yes. Because yes. there are some people who can who love a, a milk chocolate but can't stand dark chocolate. That's fair. That's very fair. That's very fair. That's a solid pick. That's a solid pick. Is the regular milk chocolate a bit bland? Yes. Perhaps. I, th- I think that is the case. What is decidedly not bland is going to be my number two overall mm-hmm. pick. And it satisfies. It's the Snickers. <laughs> Snickers is a good one. It's the Snickers. That a nougat, lot of... The nougat. The caramel. It's got a good combination of uh, flavors and textures. It, 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 this, this, the Snickers, I feel like is one of those candy bars that should be in contention of top five constantly. Hmm. Constantly. Constantly. Just, it's, it, it's just, it, Snickers satisfies. You're not you unless yeah. you have a Snickers. You're not you when you're hungry. Eat you a Snickers. Snickers. Mm-hmm. We all know the ads. We know it. We love we've, them. We've been there. We've we been saw there. we saw Betty White get tackled by some middle aged men playing tackle football. Yeah. in some mud. Rip in peace. R. I. P. In pieces. We love her. Yes. Sam, your number two overall pick. Yes, my number two overall pick. I'm going to, um, I'm going to switch over and Ooh, go over to the fruit candy early. Go into the fruit candy a little early, and just because, uh, you know, at some point you got to get a little variation. Those chocolates. Can blend all together. Of course. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna say. Let's taste the rainbow. Ah, the Skittles. We're going with Skittles. The Skittles. The first of the candy-coated small handful candies. Yes. Yes. Uh, a solid pick. A solid pick. A classic of the fruit candy. A mm-hmm. staple of the fruit candy. Um, I see nothing wrong with this option. It's a good option. If you want to fuck with people, take some Skittles. Take some M and M's. Dump it in a bowl. Let them figure it out on their own. You know, if they're not paying attention, great thing. As soon as you tell people that there are some Skittles in there, then they're like, mm, and... What I, what I like even more is you get one of the really, really big bags of M&Ms, like really big bag of M&Ms, and then you get like two of the fun size Skittles. Oh, the little... Just so that like every now and again, they get like one. And they're like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> That's a fun one. That's a good idea. Well, first is textural difference because like you get the get the M and then the then the skill that mm-hmm. eh, er. yeah, yeah and then you got the flavor oh yeah, oh, yeah. it's like chocolate and ugh, lime yeah <laughs> they got rid of the lime skittle didn't did they? they I think they replaced the lime skittle or they replaced the green skittle to lime I remember this controversy hmm. about a decade ago interesting regardless interesting my third overall pick I'm going across the Pacific Ocean oh going across the Pacific Ocean to our brethren in Japan who are very very big fans of the multitude of varieties mm, of yes. the Kit Kat. The Kit Kat. The Kit Kat. <clears throat> Another staple. The the little the little mush that's between the wafers mm-hmm. covered in chocolate. That little mush, interestingly enough, when they have a batch of Kit Kats that like doesn't come out of the mold right, that like breaks apart, that little mush with a couple of added ingredients is basically defective Kit Kats that cannot be sold simply because of form, not because of flavor or ingredients, and then they are just freaking sawdusted up into that mush that goes... So when, oh. you, so when you are eating a Kit Kat, 
you are eating a Kit Kat that is layered with crispy wafers and Kit Kat, which is then layered with crispy. Wa- and you yeah, see where that's, the, the Kit Kat section begins. It really does. So that wow. was number three overall pick for my team, the Kit Kat. The Kit Kat. The Kit Kat. Okay, um, number three for me. Um, we're going to go. Uh, I was thinking it, and then and then uh, Lord Long Qua said it in the chat. Oh, I will also take a journey, but across a different ocean, head over and get the classic Easter candy, the Cadbury egg. The Cadbury egg. That's a good. That's a value pick right there. It's a good one. That is a that is a value third round pick if I've ever heard one. That was that was solid. That's a very solid candy. The Cadbury egg. Staple of the American Easter, mm-hmm. a staple, I hear, of more European, of our more European brethren, a staple just year round. Year round, the Cadbury it's crazy, Cadbury cream egg, crazy, which is just unfathomable to me how we are the obese ones and not them. Yes, I know processed foods. Yes, I know fast food. Yes, I know blah 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 blah. Whatever. But the it's Cadbury a, egg. It's also interesting because I, I remember a statistic course has been many years since I saw it, but. In Europe, they prefer dark chocolates, where we prefer milk mm. chocolates. I personally prefer dark chocolate over a milk chocolate as well. I prefer dark chocolate as well. I'm, I think that's I'm into that. That's a fair assessment. Yeah. Now, I think it's time I make my first foray into the fruity and the fruity the fruity candy that is also a subset of candy that we have not yet brought up. Mm. The sour candy. Oh yes, with that of the Sour Patch Kids. Yes, indeed. Pick. Now the Sour Patch Kids, they're sour and they're sweet, and then they're gone because mm-hmm. you've swallowed them whole. Is it a bit weird that their ad campaign depicts people eating depictions of children? A little bit, usually Ooh. other children. Is it weird that it shows them, like, vandalizing someone's car, then giving them a hug, and then disappearing, and the guy's like, well, that's fine. Yeah, that's it's, that's weird. It stands out to me, but... It is a strange... If you've eaten, if you have had the Sour Patch Kids, I'm not a big fan of the Sour Candy. The Sour mm. Patch Kid, the sour and sweet nature makes it more appealing to those that are not normally disposed to enjoying... Predisposed, sorry, to enjoying a sour candy mm, like indeed. myself. Okay. Yeah. The the sub varieties, the pure watermelon, the various different flavor. Got to go with sour patch kids. Sour patch kids. That'll okay. be, and I can tell you right now, it's going to be my only foray into the fruit candies. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Uh, so you don't take my pick. <laughs> um. See, I've got my fifth one lined up because my fifth one's going to be for me. Oh yeah, same. Um, but my fourth one, <laughs> the fifth one's going to draw some heat for me. Oh really? That's going to be all right. You know, it's it's been on my mind and not one of my particular favorites, but I've known a lot of people who have uh, just consumed many, many a Three Musketeers bar. Ah, that's a contentious pick. That is a contentious pick. That might be very like is like gr- where you grew up dependent because like growing up everybody I knew liked those I did not now Just too much too much too th- similar I oh. have had I've had the opposite experience I love I love the Three Musketeer it's a texture thing for me the textural difference of the the airiness of yes. the of the of the chocolate cream whatever the fuck it is yeah I like that textural difference. It is very rare I come across someone who is also a fan of the Three Musketeer in my life. Interesting. Okay. So that's why I wouldn't I wouldn't have I wouldn't have pegged the the Three Musketeer with a pick, hmm. even though I, it is close to my heart, simply because of that fact. One thing that I will peg, despite what the internet and everyone around me says, and what I know you are going to say, because you hate this candy, okay. and technically it is two candies. That are effectively the same, except one has an almond and one does not. Oh, the mound and the almond joy. The mound and the almond joy. The coconut, shaved coconut cream sugar mix wrapped in delicious milk chocolate. Coconut is the worst food ever created. You are objectively wrong about that. I am objectively wrong. 
Brussels sprouts? I like a Brussels sprout. This is not this draft, but I like a Brussels sprout. Vegetables is on the table. Yes, it is. Vegetables is on the table. Brussels sprouts will not make the list. <laughs> oh, no. If you draft Brussels sprouts, I'm, I'm walking. As out. much as I enjoy a Brussels sprout, definitely not on the list. Uh, now, I will say, yes, technically is two candies. They are effectively the same. Yeah, one has an almond on it. One has literally a single whole almond on Look, it. Look. And they are both phenomenal. Sometimes you feel like a nut. Sometimes you don't. Peter Paul, Almond Joys have nuts, and Mounds don't. Yes, and they're both fantastic. They're both horrible. Now, my fifth pick. Last pick of the draft. Last pick of the draft. Again, this one is for me. Uh, this, this candy has remained my favorite through the years, and it also gets a lot of hate on the internet, uh, and that is the Tootsie Pop. Mm, the Tootsie Pop? Yes. Not the Tootsie Roll. The nope. Tootsie Pop. Yes. I do not. I will not eat a Tootsie roll, uh, roll by itself. I will eat a Tootsie Pop. Those things caught up my mouth, man. I don't. I don't trust them. I sacrifice. Wow. My body for them. That now, how many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop? You know they did a study on that once, like, and I don't care. Like three hundred something. It's like yeah, like three hundred fifty-eight or something like that. The reason I pulled that number out of my head is because I vividly. Well, I don't remember elementary school very much. I don't. Elementary school was a fine time at best for me. Fair enough. But I have a vivid. I mean, vivid memory. Third grade, in elementary school. One of the kids. We were doing some game. In class. It was right before recess. And one of the prizes you got for said game was candy. One of the candies was the Tootsie Pop. Now, the person who won one of the Tootsie Pops says, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to lick it. And I'm going to put a little line on the board every single time I lick it. And we're going to count the number of times it takes for me to get to the center of this Tootsie Pop. Now, was this a purely scientific experiment? No. No. Hmm. No. Were some of them licks? Yes. Were some of them going all in on the mouth, rolling it around a little bit and popping it back out? Yes. We got to about, like, I, th- I, th- I literally think we got over 300. Yeah? Yeah. So I pulled it up here. Um, according to NPR. NPR? <laughs> NPR. <laughs> Mathematicians at the New York University have come up with an answer of a 1,000. 1,000? But a group of engineering students from Purdue University reported that its licking machine, modeled after a human tongue, licking mach- a licking took an machine. average of 364 licks to get to the center of the Tootsie Pop. Now, let's keep, let's keep the licking machine away from... I was going to say... <laughs> Once the licking machine was done with the Tootsie Pop. I mean, well, I'm I'm saying let's keep the the let's let's keep the licking machine in the lab instead of say for example a a sex shop. Yes. Because then men would be without any jobs. I feel. Well, I you know the 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 vibr- the vibrator has already dealt cut in deeply to the the marketplace. <laughs> I don't even know where I'm going. I don't know where you're going with this either. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going with this. But regardless, the candy draft. Candy draft is complete. Candy draft is complete. Sam has drafted the classic Hershey's chocolate bar, the Skittles, the Cadbury egg, the Three Musketeers, and the Tootsie Pop. I, Connor, have drafted the Reese's peanut butter cup, the Snickers, the Kit Kat, the Sour Patch Kids, and the beloved Mound slash Almond Joy. If you have comments in the TikTok live, feel free. We will be putting up. We will be putting up a poll on our Instagram uh, when the podcast posts. Yeah, maybe a little bit after. Yeah. and and we'll we'll yeah. survey the Instagram following to get a final result about who wins this. Because right now the running total is Sam one, Connor zero, which is a crock. Oh shit! So head on over to the Instagram. Go ahead and follow us, and be ready for when that drops. All right. Candy's out. Candy's out. What do we replace it with? Ooh, what do we replace it with? Do we want to do... Oh, okay. A couple options to replace it with. Whiskey. Whiskey. Smells good, smells bad. 
two good options. Two different we, options, good smells and bad smells. And bad smells. Or we can slap some D&D feats in there. What or some a, other D&D related thing. Because there's a couple D&D things, but there's a couple that aren't. Well, there's uh, quite a bit that aren't. Well, we'll leave it up to TikTok chat. How's that? We've got a couple people in TikTok chat. Go ahead and tell us uh, what we should replace this the that item on the table with for next uh the next time draft. re-roll whether it's whiskeys good smells bad smells or D D feats uh, and we'll we'll scroll through at the end yes uh goodbye lord longqua he's headed out fairly well fairly well all right well with all that waffling out of the way we uh, waffled a lot we have twenty five thousand followers on tiktok now yes yay and and uh a large portion of that actually in the past Two days. Yes. 2,000 uh, people joined us. Viral viral videos uh, be popping like that. They do. And unexpected ones, especially. Yes. A, a lovely 100,000 view video in a day for us of, uh, of, a, of a characterization of how we met. Indeed. It was wonderful. Indeed. It was wonderful. Also want to thank the YouTube audience where <laughs> last time we spoke, we were like, wow, Spellpoints is doing really good. It's got like a couple thousand views. Yeah. And um, it's like 36,000 now with a 90% like rate and a lot of comments. Now, sure, a lot of the comments are people butthurt because, ooh, you can't use spell points with the warlock. That's the point of the video. <laughs> Is that and traditionally you couldn't, but he put it together a way. But I put it together. And they, were, and they were salty that I was like, it's a rule in a core rule book, which it is. And I even made a point to say, Warlocks don't normally get this, but if we do it like this, they can. And this is why I think it's a good idea. So, yeah. uh, so you know, haters I, be hating. I was, you know, I was thinking earlier, had we not had just so much to go over today, I would have given you some time to really, really get into this. Eh, I don't uh, want to. But we don't have time. And I don't want to. Let's, let's get into... We've already, uh, we've already uh, waffled on for... Over 25 minutes. <laughs> well, look, Sprig and Glenn says that uh, he's enjoying being a first-time viewer here because of our of antics with candy. <laughs> of course. We love to that uh, you're here, too. Uh, next time, it might be um, it might be video games. It might be fast food or soda. It might be child children's birthday party activities. I don't know if I'm going to be able to come up with five of those, but we'll, we'll, we'll do that. We have exclamations on there. <laughs> we got some weird ones on there. <laughs> But uh, we 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 might we might we we might need to like hone the table. A little we'll bit. get there because I feel like we're gonna eventually get one that we struggle to come up with five picks each for. We'll we'll cross that bridge when it comes. But in the meantime, we got some we got some some news, some spicy news. We weren't going to do a news segment because there's so much to talk about with the one D and D playtest material on the experts mm-hmm. group. Of classes. Yes, there are groups of classes. One of them is called Experts, which includes the Bard, the Ranger, the Rogue. And they mentioned the Artificer, even though the Artificer will not be available in the 1D&D Player's Handbook. But first, we got two news items and a quick wrap-up thing. Yeah. I'm just going to run through. Hit them. Lego D&D sets are in the works, and they're going to be designed by the fans. You might be able to pick up your own Lego D&D set in the not-so-distant future, quite literally, The LEGO Ideas Initiative is asking for community designs, and the best one will be chosen as the first official Dungeons & Dragons LEGO kit. Revealed via the latest LEGO Ideas blog, the competition celebrates 50 years of Dungeons & Dragons by asking fans to design display models of characters or monsters, functional kits for players and Dungeon Masters, or customizable builds that include locations from D&D lore. The winner will be getting... Womp womp. 1%. Of the total net sales of their design, a swag bag of D&D goodies, and 10 copies of the LEGO D&D set. The fan vote is going to take place sometime between November 28th and December 12th. The final design presumably launched sometime in 2023. That's awesome. That's pretty cool. I think it's cool that they're getting it fan designed. I think it's cool that they're offering, like, making it a competition that gets the the fans involved. One um, percent of total net sales for a designer of a Lego product is probably on the low side, but at least it is net and not gross. Right. Which they will still likely be making millions of dollars from this. If I'm being completely honest. Yeah. Which uh, it, it, it's fine. Yeah. 
It's fine. Someone someone making a fun design for a Lego product and then getting like a million dollars, a uh, quote unquote swag bag of D&D goodies and then 10 copies of their design once it comes to market. I think that's kind of fair. Yeah. You're probably not going to get a lot of the professional D, uh, not D&D, professional uh, Lego builders out there doing this just simply due to the uh, nature of, of the reward. But hey, if you like Legos. Go out, hit it. If you're an artiste who likes both Legos and D and D, you can come up with a cool concept design, and you might win. Uh, you might get your bag. Go get that bag. Yeah, as, get that as swag I, bag. I I was saying get that bag as in money, but also the swag bag of D and D goodies. <laughs> get that dough. Get that. Get that sugar. That bread. Get, get that. that baguette. That's me eating the bread. Okay. Second news item. Sam will be able to talk more on this in a moment, but let me set this up. (laughs) Dungeons & Dragons wants to make miniatures with your, yes, your person watching the TikTok live or listening in the podcast in their car or listening to it on their microwave oven or listening to it with headphones while walking down the street or listening to it loudly on a speaker in a public place and now people are going to be looking at you weirdly because someone just exclaimed and now is talking really weird in a podcast voice. Your face. On a D&D miniature. <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons wants to put your face on a custom-made miniature. During Hasbro's Investor Day earlier last week, Wizards of the Coast president Cynthia Williams discussed additional ways that Hasbro could cater to the Dungeons and Dragons player base. She noted that Dungeon Masters make up about 20% of the game's player base, but currently comprise the biggest share of paying players on D&D Beyond. However... Williams noted that other players value character creation and customization and suggested integrating Hasbro's existing selfie series into character creation so that players could create a custom-made D&D miniature with their face on it. The Hasbro selfie series launched earlier this month, or last month, yes, launched last month in September as a way for fans to celebrate certain franchises and create custom-made action figures that include their facial likenesses. Buyers use the Hasbro Pulse app to scan their face, which is then put on a six-inch collector's figure. Currently, Hasbro Selfie Series supports custom-made figures based on the Power Rangers, Ghostbusters, Marvel, Star Wars, and G.I. Joe franchises. Sam, we we tried this out. Yeah, download the app. Download the app in the app. <laughs> and uh, scanned my face and uh, and selected Spider-Man. We went into the Marvel Legends. We selected Spider-Man. And let me tell you, it was kind of horrific. It's cursed. Somewhat cursed. <laughs> I mean, honestly, though, for... I mean, you remember, you remember Miis that you could take much, a picture and put a... Yeah. Much more sophisticated than the me. Not as sophisticated, I would say, as, like, the Xbox Connect. No. Not as sophisticated as face scans for filters that you can find on TikTok and Snapchat and the like. But, but still impressive. Still impressive. They grafted onto an action figure. It's $50 to buy a custom action figure with your face on it, which, whilst pricey, it's custom, one-of-a-kind made, so... And you do have a little bit of uh, of control over, okay, let's... You, you get a, a very... It's like few of each different kind of character mm-hmm. or each different series. You can adjust your look a little bit with your skin tone, your hair, your f- facial hair. That is one thing. Is they basically gave you five color options for hair, facial hair, and skin tones. Mm-hmm. Why that couldn't be a slider? Right. I think that would be a lot better. It would make manufacturing a bit more difficult because you need a more wide variety of colors. But you're fucking Hasbro. Figure it out. Right. Um, I think it's neat. I probably would never do that. It yeah, makes me uncomfy. Yeah, I don't. I'm uh, there. I'm sure there are people who love to see themselves in that, in that style. Um, and uh, not. I'm not one of those. And I think it's cool if like you're a big tiefling stan, and you want to have like a pink horned tiefling, say paladin, Michaela, with your face. I think that's pretty cool. Fifty dollars, cool, or more. Mm. TBD. To be, to be determined. Final thing, we don't have a lot to say about it, but it is important, so we're going to report on it. Hasbro has announced a new Dungeons and Dragons lead. Hasbro has named Dan Rawson as the new senior vice president for the Dungeons and Dragons brand. He was announced as the new du- head of the Dungeons and Dragons franchise, filling a role that was posted four months ago. 
He comes from the tech sector, having worked for Microsoft Dynamics 365 as the chief operating officer, with previous stints at Coupang, a South Korean online marketplace, and Flipkart, an Indian e-commerce company. His LinkedIn profile states that he is a Harvard and Kellogg-educated former Marine captain, and he is also a longtime D&D player, having played the game as a child and now plays games with his family. According to the press release, Hasbro stated that his job responsibilities will include, quote, lead overall Dungeons and Dragons brand growth and profitability across digital, physical, and entertainment. The job listing's responsibilities notes that Rawson will serve as the primary senior spokesperson for the brand internally and externally, and will be responsible for evolving the D&D tabletop experience to both physical and digital environments. So he's going to be in charge of uh, printing the new books and marketing, and mm-hmm. he's probably going to have a, a say in the vision of, say, the virtual tabletop for one D&D, be that good or bad. Can't really say. To be determined. And we will keep you updated as we are in this business now. Indeed. Indeed. Now, that's all the news for today. We didn't really want to do news. And uh, we're nearly 40 minutes into the podcast already. It's but. Cool. Yes, we're going to be a chonka boy. But. But. It was important. It was, it, was, it was cool stuff. And, of course, they would do that when uh, when we got a chonk one to make. Right? So, nah, thanks, right. Wizards of the Coast. You double fucked us. You're giving us content, but all at once. Yes. I'm not going to say too much. Uh, just enough. But I haven't said enough. Mm. One D&D, Unearthed Arcana 2022 from October. Expert classes. These are rules. Th- this is a, first of all, a chonky. It's big. It's a very big PDF. It's like 38 pages. And it's I... Like 37 pages long. It is big. And a quick note before we get into this. When we're looking at these playtest documents, they need to be looked as a collective as we add new things on. But changes made, the most recent version supersedes anything that they put in the previous one. Mm-hmm. They've already made changes to getting inspiration from rolling, and they've already changed to critical hits. So those rules that are new here now supersede the rules that we were complaining about from the last one. Yep. I just want that to put. The, I just want to put that out there. There are four major sections to this. There are the expert classes. There are feats, spell lists, and the rules glossary. Now, expert class. What is that? The expert class. I want to play an expert. All right. Well, what? Which which expert do you want to play? Because there's multiple. There are now class groups. The four that uh, they talked about in one of the introduction videos that you can find on YouTube at Dungeons and Dragons official YouTube channel. They've got a couple of videos outlining the three classes there are going to be all the classes are going to be grouped by their theme and there's going to be four groups the experts the warriors the priests and the mages the experts that we're we looking at today include the bard the ranger and the rogue these classes all inherently have expertise multiple times multiple times yes you'll notice that as they they talked about this in the videos that each group is going to have features that are similar to others within the group, if Mm -hmm. not exactly the same. All the experts have expertise. One would assume that warriors would have fighting styles. One would assume that the priests have something akin to channel divinity and the like. Mages... Big spell cast, you guys. Cast spells, cool. (laughs) Go mages. Go mages. They're probably still really fucking strong. Uh, Quick overview. The bard... A couple of slight balancing changes, I think, net to a slight nerf in some regards, but the some but the key abilities are getting buffed. Mm-hmm. Bardic Inspiration is now going to be using a reaction. Uh, you can heal with it. There's no more counter charm. Delayed Jack of All Trades, delayed a couple things. There's no additional magical secrets for the lore bard. We'll get into all this. Yes. The Ranger, I think, is almost buffed in every single phase of the game. Expertise right out of the gate, spell casting right out of the gate, both at level one. Mm -hmm. You still get your fighting styles. A lot of their features that were missing in in previous versions of the Ranger have been added or changed to fit a more modern style of D&D. Hunter's Mark is not a concentration spell for the Ranger. Mm -hmm. So you can now use Hunter's Mark without feeling bad. (laughs) Very good. 
and the hunter subclass that they present with it. Each of these classes has one subclass with them. Yes. The lore bard. We'll get the others eventually. The hunter ranger and the thief rogue. The hunter ranger is the... No longer do you have options at each subclass feature, but the options they provide you are basically the best options that you would have had. And in many cases, anyone that was playing a hunter ranger kind of picked the same things because there's the objectively better ones. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the rogue. Largely unchanged. Streamlined rule mechanics for sneak attack. A couple reorganizing of class features but largely unchanged maybe slightly nerfed but then yeah. buffed by one of the rule changes of dual wielding so we'll get into that too du- dual wielding du- 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 dual wielding technically isn't a thing it is le- weapons with the light property and it does not require a bonus action anymore next we have feats largely fourth level feats at this point all feats have a level now mm-hmm. there are some first level feats Pretty much all of the fourth level feats are half feats. Yes. We saw a lot of the first level feats come in the last installation uh, during character creation because you know everybody gets a first level feat. So now we're seeing these as you get to your first level up in this, in your playtesting of these playtest materials. Here's what you can take. Uh, power gamers and min-maxers everywhere are crying because sharpshooter and great weapon master do no longer have a minus five penalty to your attack roll for plus ten damage. Mm-hmm. I'm a little bit upset, but we'll get to there. We'll get to there. We also have Epic Boons, which now replace all 20th level features. The normal 20th level features that classes would have gotten are now going to be the 18th level features, followed by a feat slot of your choice, followed by an Epic Boon, which can also simply just be a feat if you would prefer. Next, we have the full spell lists, cantrips to 9th level spells for the primal, divine and arcane spell lists there are now only three quick note with the bard the only full spell caster in this unearthed arcana they limit how which classes can get what kinds of spells by the school of magic now. yes that was a weird choice in my opinion it was it's a bit of a concern but they've also changed some of the schools of magic for certain spells and there's a category of the ones that were changed that seem almost exclusively to make sure that the bard has some classic bard staples that they would want. Mm-hmm. Shatter, Thunder Wave, Earthquake, and the like. There's also been two spells that specifically have been changed. Barkskin and Guidance. Guidance is a reaction, and you can only do it to a person once per day. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. And then the rules glossary updated rules any term underlined will appear at the end in the glossary and those terms have been changed either from the previous unearthed arcana or from the original player's handbook set of rules and there is plenty to talk about with that oh yeah but let's get to the classes we got the bard the bard starting off with the bard um Obviously, the the lore of the Bard hasn't changed too much. They're magical beings who base their, their skills on performance. Um, so when you go into creating a Bard, you're still a D8 hit, uh, hit die class. Um, and so something interesting is when it comes to their proficiencies. Still dex and charisma. And now they only suggest... They suggest that you take pre- deception, performance, and persuasion. But you do have the option of any three skills. That is one thing that I really like. When it comes to the leveling up, they provide suggestions for everything. Skills to take, spells to pick, everything. But you can do, you can take whatever you want, but they offer suggestions, which is a great place for brand new players that Mm -hmm. are leveling up and don't quite know what to pick. Spell list is a very big list. It's a very big list, and with the new, again, with the new school's limitations, could get confusing. And if you exclusively took the suggested spells, you're going to have a very well-rounded spellcaster, very well-rounded character that is quintessential of that character archetype. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Next up, uh, weapons. They have simple weapons. Bard before had some very strange choices in the 2014 book. Uh, a, A note on simple weapons, the short sword... Short sword. It's now a simple weapon. Unchanged, but simple instead of martial. So, mm-hmm. 
If you have swappable weapon proficiency, you can now wield a short sword, which makes complete sense. Makes absolute sense. A very simple weapon to wield. <laughs> like, I feel like I could wield a short sword, if I'm being completely honest. Let's not test that. I would love to. And, of course, their tools, they get three musical instruments. That's the same. All right. We're not going to go through in excruciating detail of everything. They get first level spell casting. They only have access to divination, enchantment, illusion, and transmutation spells. Some spells have been changed around. There's more spells in the divination school. There's some more spells in the transmutation school that would give the bard access to things that they would have had or mm-hmm. new things that they never had access to. But bardic inspiration is the biggest change here. Bardic inspiration starts as a D6 as always. They are reaction abilities now Yes. instead of bonus action abilities. So you're not handing them out and then people forgetting about them. You are using them when they need to be used. They can be used to boost a D20 test. So attack roll, ability check, or saving throw as they can in the PHB. They can also be used to heal immediately after another creature within 60 feet of you that you can see in here takes damage. You can use your reaction to roll your bardic inspiration die and restore a number of hit points equal to the roll. The bard is now, I would argue, the ultimate healer. Especially with one of the upcoming features. But yeah, that reaction healing, I mean, at least until, you know, you have as, you have as many bardic inspirations as you have proficiency bonus. Uh, so all of a sudden, you know, you just have the ability to hold one and the first time, you know, your fighter, your barbarian, your whatever goes down, get them right back up. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it is healing word on a reaction. It is. And you, it's a you're better. getting you at level one, you can get people up twice. By level three, you have second level spells. You get healing word for free. The second level feature, Song of Restoration, which is a facsimile for uh Song of Rest. Song of Rest. Instead of just adding more hit dice on a short rest, you just get certain healing spells for free. Well, not entirely healing spells. But at level three, you now have spell slots that you can use for healing word and you have two uses of your bardic inspiration on a reaction from 60 feet away to get someone up if you take the guidance cantrip i mean the bard is was always one of the ultimate support classes the bard is even more bardy and i think bardic inspiration is even more useful i don't know if being able to heal with a bardic inspiration at 60 foot range as a reaction is necessarily balanced but I'm willing to give it a go. Like I'm, I'm, I'm pumped about that, honestly. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and I think the, uh, I, I can definitely see uh, the 2014 bard ex- bardic inspiration being that, that preparatory. All right, here's one for you. As you know, or especially since a lot of uh, you know lower levels, you don't have a lot of bonus actions. Yeah. So the bonus action. All right, I'll do my big thing and then give this to you. Um, I think that turning to a reaction. Some good, some bad, but I think that healing is a, is a very strong buff. It is. Second level features are expertise, double proficiency in two skills of your choice, and the songs of restoration. At certain levels, you learn a spell and you always have them prepared. At second level, you get healing word. Fourth level, less, lesser restoration. At sixth level, mass healing word. At eighth level, freedom of movement, which is a, kind of the odd one out. And then at tenth level, you get greater restoration. They never count against the spells that you have prepared. So you just always have healing options. Every yeah. bard. And I, I do think that is better than just 1d6 bonus healing on a short rest. Oh, objectively better. This um, is straight buff. Especially since a lot of people are moving away from the short rest mechanic. Yes. Um, yes. Which is a bit of a shame. There are some short rest classes that could really shine mm-hmm. with a good uses, usage of short rests and uh, a number of combats in a day. But that's not how a lot of people play. And it seems like they're designing it, or the bard, or these classes in general, around how people are actually playing fifth edition as opposed to how they thought they would mm-hmm. when they originally made it. Third so, level is the subclass. Fourth level is now uh, you gain a feat. Whether yes. that feat is one that is listed later or very specifically mentioned, the ability score increase feat. Yes, it is now the default that you get a feat. And if you want to increase your ability scores, that is a feat option, and it is repeatable, so mm-hmm. you can take it multiple times. Fifth level, Connor, Sam, where's Jack of All Trades? It's at level five. Yeah. They delayed Jack of All Trades. 
a bit of a weird inclu- includement, including... Uh, inclusion? Inclusion. Jeez. A weird inclusion. It was originally the second level feature. Yeah. I think the delay is fine. It, it basically replaced a uh, font of inspiration, which comes, again, later. Yes. Adding half your proficiency bonus rounded down to an ability check. I want to point out ability checks that applies to the initiative roll. Mm-hmm. Make sure you're adding it there. That also kind of makes the bard one of the best counterspellers in the game because counterspell is based on an ability check that you make using your spellcasting ability modifier. So you also get to add half of your proficiency bonus to it with Jack of All Trades. If you don't already have a proficiency in Arcana. Oh, that's right. Well, it's not an Arcana check. It's an Arcana check. Are you sure? Yeah, it's, a, it's an Arcana check against 10 plus the spells level. That's the DC. I don't think that's right. I'm checking it. All right. I'm checking it. Counterspell. I know how to spell. That's CR. Yes. You attempt to interrupt, blah, blah, blah. If it is a, if it is a casting of a spell of fourth level or high, higher, you make an ability check using your spell casting ability. The DC equals oh, 10 plus okay. the spell's level. I think I've always run it as an arcana check. Which... I wouldn't be surprised if they changed the counterspell rule eventually to just be that. I think that makes sense. But if they don't, Jack of all trades, you can add half your proficiency mm-hmm. bonus to counterspelling now. Great. Cool. Always a good feature. Pretty much unchanged entirely. And they just delayed it a couple of levels. And totally they gave fine. you an example of how to use it. Yes. Which is nice. They, they include a lot of new player things that make it more useful. Yeah. Um, Sixth level subclass, seventh level font of bardic inspiration, which used to be, I believe, a fourth level feature. It was level five before. Level five. Yes. So they delayed it two levels. You regain your bardic inspiration on a short or long rest instead of just a long rest. And the more important part, in addition, if a creature rolls your bardic inspiration and gets a one after the re- any rerolls you might have, that use of your bardic inspiration isn't expended. Yes. So it is buffed slightly. And I think the delay is fine, especially because they've added the healing now to Bardic Inspiration. If you got uh, at at level four, your proficiency bonus is three. Three. Sorry. Two? Two. 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 I I looked at the wrong column. You get three (laughs) at level five. Uh, Yes, correct. So at level five, you would you go from I can use my Bardic Inspiration twice per day to immediately six per day. If you get a short rest in, mm-hmm. which is a very big jump for the bard. Seventh level, it's delayed a little bit. So it's now two, three, then six, then eight, then ten, and, 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 It's a bit more of an, a simple progression, a bit more utility with the rolling a one. Bards are going to be able to throw out their die all over the fucking place, mm-hmm. which is great. And it's actually going to get used. Eighth level, you get a feat. Ninth level, you get expertise again. 10th level, you get a subclass feature. 11th level, you get magical secrets. You can choose any spell from arcane, divine, or primal. You can, When you prepare it, you can prepare up to two spells, and you use your spell casting for it. With magical secrets, in addition, the um, prepared can be from any list and from any school of magic. Yes. Otherwise, they have to follow your bard yes. rules. Um. I'm kind of surprised they didn't buff it because they're kind of going this way of you can change your magical secrets every long rest. Mm -hmm. I think that might be what the long card does. The spell casting. They changed spell casting. Oh, that's right. Because you can change. Oh, so you just can. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because they're a prepared caster now. Yeah. Before that. Before it was you could only you chose on level up and could only change on level up. So you now they're prepared casters. So you can change you. (laughs) Once you hit 11th level. You can just pick two spells that exist in D&D every day, which is, wow. Pretty cool. It it also makes sense why we'll get to it in a little bit. The lore bard does not get additional magical secrets anymore, because that is very powerful. 12th level, you get a feat. 14th level, you get a subclass feature. 15th level, you get further magical secrets. Every bard gets it. Mm -hmm. You get two more. Two more. That's good shit. Yeah, you get two more. 16th level feat, 18th level, the superior bardic inspiration. When you roll initiative, you regain two expended uses of bardic inspiration. Which is better than the old version, which was when you roll initiative and have no uses of your bardic inspiration, you get one. You get two just any time, even if you... Much better. Much better. Much better. It's a be- It's also underwhelming for an 18th level feature still, but 
not nearly as sad as a 20th level feature. <laughs> the, and we've talked, you and I have talked about this before, but just so many of the 20th level features across all classes suck. Unless you're a paladin. Yeah. 19th level, you defeat 18th or er, 20th. 20th level. You, you, 19th level, guys, level down. Guys You're going down. to 18th level. level. We'll get to Fuck we'll get to downcasting. Yes, spells for the ranger. the ranger. That's a little, little teaser there. But 20th level, you get an epic boon. They suggest the epic boon of luck, but you pick whatever you want. Pick whatever you want. We'll get to, we'll talk about those because they're included later in the document. Yes, uh, they also provide spell recommendations for what you should prepare at every level of bard what spells you should be adding to your prepared list and some of them are very good vicious mockery press digitation disguise self color spray healing word blur shatter and then some that are a bit more situational tongues calm emotions seeming legend lore it, it it wavers, but on on the whole, the spell recommendations are very good. One second, I had a comment from TikTok that speared me. What are the uh, what are the spell casting classes or uh, schools of magic for Bard again? I they can't. are. Uh, it is the arcane spell list. But the cl- the, uh, the schools. The schools of magic are divination, enchantment, illusion, and transmutation. So somebody just pointed out, uh, uh, taken for granted. Uh, wait, does that mean bards can't cast counterspell? Because I just looked, counterspell is abjuration. Oh, you. Yep. Yeah, the bards never had access to counterspell natively. You always had to take counterspell as a magical secret originally. Counterspell being one of the top tier magical secret options that the bard could take. And when the lore bard would get their additional magical secrets previously at 6th level, they do no longer get that, but previously at 6th level, you're basically only one level delayed from your normal spell progression as a wizard or any other class that naturally gets counterspell, and then you're going to be a better counterspeller than pretty much any (laughs) other player except maybe an abjuration wizard. Maybe. So there we go. Good good question taken for Very granted. Good. Very good question. Thank you. Uh, the College of Lore subclass. At third level, you get bonus proficiencies. You gain three additional proficiencies. If you already have one of the proficiencies... Oh, sorry. You gain three skill proficiencies. Arcana, History, and Nature, specifically. If you already have one of those proficiencies, you can choose a skill proficiency that you lack and gain proficiency. You also get Cutting Words. Cut you them sh- words. Oh, yeah. When a creature you can see within 60 feet of yourself succeeds on an ability check or an attack roll, you can use your reaction to expend a use of your bardic inspiration die, rolling it and subtracting it from the roll, potentially turning it into a failure, much like cutting words. The only difference is I believe this one does not include damage, which the 2014 bard does include damage. A bit of a weird exclusion, but ultimately I think if you're not using cutting words to reduce damage, you're using it to try and turn a hit into a miss or trying to let them fail a check to break out of like an entangle or something. I will say also as a note, and I have been kind of just in this document in general, I haven't seen the phrase that is used in the 2014. You can choose to make this feat use this feature after the creature makes the attack roll, but before the DM determines whether the roll or ability check succeeds or fails. Um, I've, I've not seen that a lot uh, through this document. And mm-hmm. that's a lo- included in a lot of places in the 2014 version. It's yeah. I've, th- Maybe it's the change in philosophy for how they're designing things, but I also wouldn't be surprised if like they're leaving some details out because it's playtest. True. And come up with final wording. But at the same time, you're, I know right. a, no, a lo- the way at least we play a lot is as soon as that roll is made, the words a uh, number and then the game going fail or success. Yes. Versus here's my number. Pause. I want to use my ability. <laughs> yeah. Uh, six level cunning inspiration. When any creature rolls your Bardic Inspiration die, that creature can roll the die twice and use the higher of two rolls. Advantage on Bardic Inspiration rolls. Mm -hmm. Uh, And this is a replacement for the additional magical secrets that the lore bard would normally get. I kind of like this better, if I'm entirely honest, because regular bards are already getting four sets of magical secrets. Yeah. Anyway. A 10th level improved cutting words. Whenever you use your Cutting Words feature on a creature, you can deal psychic damage to that creature equal to the number rolled on the Bardic Inspiration die plus your Charisma modifier. So in addition to reducing an attack roll or an ability check's 
you are also now dealing just extra psychic damage to them. And at 10th level, it's equal to your proficiency bonus, correct? Which is... Uh, or with the number on the die, which is a D10. Yes, a D10, a D10 plus your charisma, extra damage as a reaction. It's not. That's not too shabby. That's not bad at all. I I th- I think that a better use of your bardic inspiration is still going to be the heal option, mm-hmm. particularly later in combat. I think you should save a couple uses of it, two maybe three, just to get people back up as a reaction. Uh, particularly when initiative is weird yeah. and they would their turn would be coming up before your turn and you'd normally be able to healing word them. 14th level, the last subclass feature, Peerless Skill. When you make an ability check and fail, you can expend a use of your Bardic Inspiration die, roll the Bardic Inspiration die, add the number to the ability check, potentially turning it into a success. If the, ch- success, if the check still fails, the Bardic Inspiration is not expended. Again, very similar to the 2014 version, except for that last bit. It doesn't expend it if it still fails. Correct. Totally fine. Lovely. Bard overall, final thoughts? Um, for most of it, so I, I did see a comment earlier, I'll, we'll, we'll talk about it then, but uh, the, the, the commenter was saying that they would not want to play this new version of a bard. I think this new version of a bard is very palatable and very, very, uh, palatable. Useful, very useful in, in, many, in many instances. I don't, I don't think one is necessarily vastly superior to the other. I think the bard feels like a lateral move to a bit more streamlined, and they're kind of the same. Like yeah. maybe slightly nerfed with the delayed features, but I think the delays in the features make sense. They got rid of duds like counter charm and song of rest and replaced yeah. them with actual useful features that are good. And I think one of the biggest buffs is that not is when you fail or when you get it yeah. lower is that not expending your resources for a, for a crap for that, a crap shoot that and 60 foot reaction healing is like i would argue you with the bard maybe got a bit of a buff here i think the again spell, the spell list limitation will we need to see how that's going to play out mm-hmm. but i think it's pretty good and again not vastly superior not at all not at all no they're very if you love the bard and you play a one D bard you're probably still going to love the bard. Yeah. It's just going to be different. Right. And that's good. Now, my baby. Your baby. The ranger the class. Ranger. Progression is very similar as before. Still a D10 hit die. Uh, still strength and dexterity saving throws. You get your choice of three from animal handling, athletics, insight, investigation, nature, perception, stealth, and survival. You still get simple and martial weapons. No tool proficiencies. Light, medium, armor, and shields. Oh, boy. All right. Well, again... I'm just, I'm, I'm just jumping right in because I want to. Yeah, I was going to say. First level rangers suck, dude. They suck so much. Even revised ranger first level kind of sucks. 1 D&D first level ranger is value after value after value. Mm-hmm. Expertise. You get expertise Good. in two skill proficiencies of your choice. They suggest stealth and survival. I think those are fine options. Those are lovely options. Wonderful options. The survival skill basically replaces all of the good tracking features that the ranger would get and never use. Yeah. And I think that's totally fine. First level feature, favored enemy. You always have the hunter's mark spell prepared. It does not count against the number of spells you can prepare. Moreover, you do not have to concentrate on the spell once you cast it. It lasts for the full duration or until you use a bonus action to end it or until you are incapacitated straight up what we've been wanting from Hunter's Mark forever. Yes. Fucking finally. So additionally, since you get the next feature is your spell casting, you get that at level one, where as Rangers and Task Casters usually got it at level two. So you couldn't take Hunter's Mark until level two. Yes. And then you had to still, you didn't get it natively. You just, you, you had to pick it you still. You had to pick it. And then you had to cast it and concentrate on it. And, and at second level, third level, fourth level, fifth level, fine. But once you start to get other concentration spell entangle, like there entangle is first level too. Yeah, you would in most situations it's better to entangle an area and then just pepper them with arrows where they can't hit you than to hunters mark one of them. Yeah, and entangle also has a benefit for your companions because you're mm-hmm. they're also getting the benefit. Exactly. Hunters mark is now good. Yes, good. The spell casting you have prepared spell casting 
They suggest Cure Wounds, Guidance, Hunter's Mark, and Thorn Whip. Yes, Rangers get cantrips now. Right? Which it... In Ta- that came out in Tasha's with so a fighting good. style. So fucking good. Now this it's is, native. This is great. You get access to the primal spell list. You can pick from any school of magic except evocation. Mm-hmm. That is the only so, evocation. No blasty blasty. No big blasty spells, but the primal spell list has, doesn't really have a lot of big blasty blasties. And the ones and the spells that you do get access to are great on a ranger. You can change them whenever you take a long rest. Same as everything else. It... Oh, Fuck yes, man. Are and you again, kidding me? And again, these are getting rid of the first level features. So favorite enemy has completely changed to the Hunter's Mark thing. Before, it was you had a really... Shit. Sh- a really, like, niche... You choose an, an enemy type, and you have special things about them. And then the Tasha's revised feature is just a worse Hunter's Mark that still required concentration. And then the second, first level feature they got rid of is Natural Explorer, which, as far as I'm aware, I've never seen an actual group use besides, oh, you have that? All right, well, we'll cool. skip over this one part of the journey. Okay, yeah. cool. Now, the revised version in Tasha's does provide some utility, but not a ton. Yeah. Second level, you get a fighting style. You can choose between archery, defense, and two-weapon fighting. Whenever you gain a feat at later levels, fighting style feats are among your options as well. So you can, even though you are not in the warrior group, the warrior group exclusively gets the fighting style features. All the fighting styles are now also features that you can take as a feat. But the ranger gets access to them as well. You make note of that at level two. It's one of the things about the experts is they each kind of p- pick into some of the other class, yeah. other categories. Now a note here, fighting styles, I believe, are level one feats. You will not be able to take it at level one as a ranger. You can only take it once you hit level two. So starting at fourth level, you would be able to take fighting style feats. Third level, you get your subclass feature. Fourth level, you get a feat. Fifth level, you get extra attack. You attack twice instead of once. Sixth level, you get a subclass feature. Seventh level, you get roving. Your speed increases by 10 feet while you are not wearing heavy armor. You also have a climb and swim speed that is equal to your walking speed. This is the better Deft Explorer that it was trying to be. You get the useful mechanics of climbing speed and swimming speed, and your speed is increased by 10 feet. For pretty much every character, they're going to get 30 feet of movement at level one. And now... They're just going to have 40 and then 40 feet of swimming and 40 foot of climbing. Seventh level is a little late, but one thing you might note, for the experts at least, we don't know how this is going to play out for the other groups, the experts, and I think they even said all of the classes, are going to get their subclass features at the same levels across the board. I know that was a complaint. Um, I will point out that this seventh level feature is replacing Landstrider, which basically you get to ignore non-magical difficult terrain and the very niche... You can ignore magical plants, so you get to ignore Entangle, because every DM, you know, is casting Entangle on their players. That was a dud feat. That was a, This is much better. Yeah, this is yeah. This we like this. Go roving. Eighth, eighth level, you get a feat, or an ASA. Ninth level, you get expertise again because expert. Tenth level, you get a subclass feature. Eleventh level, you get tireless. You get two benefits. Whenever you finish a shorter long rest, you can give yourself a number of temporary hit points equal to one d eight plus your proficiency. And if you are exhausted, you can decrease your exhaustion by one when you finish a short rest and a long rest. Mm -hmm. So you you resist exhaustion a bit better, which, by the way, exhaustion now has 10 levels and is not nearly as deadly. It's not not as convoluted either. (laughs) Not as convoluted either. It's not just a weird table. It's streamlined. I don't know if I necessarily like it. We'll get to that when we get to the rules. We'll really have to see how it's implemented. Yes. Like if, if creatures are now going to have attacks that include and you take a level of exhaustion and things like that, then I think that could change it. Yeah. 10 levels then makes sense. Uh, But the short and long rest, extra D8 plus proficiency temporary hit points is just gravy. I like it. Oop. I like it. All right. (laughs) 12th level, you get a feat. 13th level, you get nature's veil. As a bonus action, you can expend a spell slot and become invisible until the end of your next turn. I don't know how valuable this is, don't we see this in the uh, what's the what's Caduceus's race? Uh, the Furbolg. The Furbolg. Don't they have a native feature like that as well? Yeah, but they but don't they, need for one turn. They can for one yeah one yeah. round they turn but invisible. But they don't need a spell slot expansion. True. I think that this feature the only change this is like the only change that I would make. I would change it from expend a spell slot to proficiency bonus number of times per long rest. That'd be fine. I I can see that. Or maybe uh, just once per shorter long rest. 
And this kind they of... They don't want to give out invisibility for a round that easily. And, and this kind of takes the place of both hide in plain sight, which was just a pretty trash feature. <laughs> oh, it was... Yeah. And yeah. vanishing, which gave you the hide as a bonus action, which at 14th level is kind of a trash feature. Yeah. When your rogues are getting it at second level. Oh no, a two level dip and, and now you are back at... Uh, anyway. Yeah. So this is a little better. It's still kind of, It's more of a lateral movement. Yeah. 14th level subclass feature, 15th level feral senses. You gain 30 feet of blind sight. I will repeat this again. At 15th level, you gain 30 feet of blind sight. You want to you want to know what that replaced? Feral senses. When you're within 30 feet of a creature you can't see, it doesn't impose disadvantage on the roll. So they um, they just took the wording and they turned it into one word. And that one word, uh, the mechanics behind it are much better. Oh, yeah. Much better. 16th level, you get a feat. 18th level, you get Foe Slayer. Your Hunter's Mark now deals an extra 1d10 instead of 1d6. High-level features are underwhelming. Yeah, it's good. It's Don't fine. get me wrong. It, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. At that point, it's not going to make a lick of difference, I would argue. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's like, all right. A little bit, maybe. 19th level, you get a feat. 20th level, you get an extra epic boon. Epic boon. They suggest the fortitude. The boon, epic boon of fortitude. Or another of your choice. They have a lot of really good um, Spell. suggestions for spells. Guidance. Hunter's Mark you get automatically. Cure wounds. Ensnaring strike. Pass without trace. Spike growth. Bark skin, which has had a pretty good change, is now more useful for the ranger than mm -hmm. ever before. Conjure barrage, etc. But speaking of conjure barrage, let's get to the hunter subclass. Yes, a little, a little, a little uh, hint at what's to come. The third level feature: hunter's prey. When you hit a creature with a weapon or an unarmed strike as part of the attack action on your turn, the weapon or unarmed strike deals an extra one d eight damage to the target if it is missing any of its hit points. You can only deal this extra damage once per turn. This is Colossus Slayer. So previously, all of the Hunter uh, subclass features, you chose one of two or three. This is just, you get Colossus Slayer. Pretty much. Yep. Pretty much. Yep. Colossus Slayer was kind of the choice to make. I mean, who wouldn't want an extra D8 on it's, any creature below its And, <laughs> and next um, oh, what's the other one? Mold. Giant Killer Horde Breaker? Horde Breaker would be the other one because you get to make an additional attack against yep. another thing. Yep. Which I think this is totally fine. You're just getting it. You're just getting it. You're just totally good. Sixth level, Hunter's Lore. While a creature is marked by your Hunter's Mark, you know whether that creature has any immunities, resistances, and vulnerabilities. And if the creature has any, you know what they are. That's always nice. Yeah. And you got a little little Cobalt Soul Monk in there. Yeah. Nice to, nice yeah, to know. Little... It makes total sense. You're hunting them, and you've magically marked them. You probably know a bit about them. Yeah. Totally good. And I believe better than all of the six level options. Previously, it was opportunity attacks against you are made with disadvantage. Oh, yeah, it's the you can stuff. yeah add a bonus four to your AC if you get hit with an attack, and um, you have advantage against saving throw or against frightened throws. Saving throw advantage on saving throws against being frightened. There we go. Ah, I think this is better than those options. I'm 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 yeah I bound to agree. Yeah. 10th level, you get multi-attack. You now always have Conjure Barrage prepared, and it does not count against the number of spells you can prepare. You can also... Remember what we said earlier about downcasting. You can cast this spell with a first and second level spell slot. When you do so, the spell's damage is reduced by 1d8 for each slot level below third. This is a brand new mechanic to D&D. Downcasting. Yeah. Upcasting was something that I believe was introduced for 5th edition to use higher level spell slots to buff lower level spells. Now we have a higher level spell that is being downgraded with lower level spell slots, meaning you're going to be able to use Conjure Barrage a lot more. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I feel about it as like philosophically downcasting spells. I like the experimentation and I like the idea of being able to use Conjure Barrage a lot more. Because that's a pretty good ranger classic, a staple. That's been a problem. A lot of our problem with the ranger spells is they're so cool. They have a lot of cool spells that don't make sense for their leveling of has the yeah. ranger being a half caster. Absolutely. And Conjure, yeah, I think Conjure Barrage. I'm, uh, right now, I'm fine with the downcasting. I think it's going to be very specific to things like this. I'm, yeah. I'm not guessing there's going to be a, you know, 
you can either ca- up cast or down cast stap- you know stapled onto the end of every spell i like i like that they're limiting it to this specific spell I'm totally okay with that. And then finally, the 14th level feature, Superior Hunter's Defense. If you are hit by an attack roll, you can use your reaction to have the attack's damage against yourself, and you can redirect the other half of the damage to one creature other than the attacker that you can see within five feet of yourself. A bit niche, a bit clunky, but I like it. It's combining two two of the features from the Hunter, the Stand Against the Tide and the Uncanny Dodge. Um, it's a little bit weaker as an uncanny dodge because it is now only attack rolls instead of just damage that you take. Uh, this one was when it hits you with an attack. Oh, okay. Well, then it's just straight up uncanny it's, dodge. It's it's tying yeah, it's tying the two together, and uh, I mean yeah, if your ranger is getting is going one on one with somebody and they get hit, all right. Well, there's you you know it's a decent use of your reaction. It's not terrible. Uh, the ranger is fucking awesome, and I already want to change my hunter ranger out for this hunter ranger. Fair enough. <laughs> I, oh, I'm the I'm playing this in my work game, and he is a first time DM, so I'm not going to do that to him. <laughs> but I would much rather have the the one D and D ranger than the current PHB or the Tasha's revised or the OG Unearthed Arcana revised ranger. This is the best ranger that we've seen since the start of fifth edition. Rangers, Rangers been long one of those classes. The community's been like, "Hey, fix it!" And fix Wizards this. has gone now multiple times. Like, we did it. And they're like, "No, you haven't. No, you we, failed. We've told you to get rid of concentration for Hunter's Mark, and they did." I, I will say, I have heard uh, some other creators say talking about how broken the Ranger is now at first level. Oh, boo! It's a very specific build you have to go with to get this broken Ranger. Well, you have expertise. Other things get expertise at first level, and it's fine. Hunter's Mark without concentration. That is an extra D6. At level 1, that is 1D8 plus 1D6 plus your dex with a longbow. If you are two-weapon fighting, 2D6 plus 2D6 plus your dexterity once. Mm -hmm. If you hit with both attacks. Is that powerful? Yeah. Is it broken? Not even slightly. They get cantrips. Paladin's probably going to get cantrips now, too. Oh, yeah. That's not broken. That's fucking sweet. The argument was you could also take hex, concentrate on hex, not concentrate on hunter mar- hunter's mark. But it's a it's a two turn wind up, and then once you kill that thing, Is then it's hex another on the primal two- list. Uh, not with the with the invocate or with the feat, the magic initiate feat. Oh, so you mean the power gamers that want to dip a f- use the entire resource of a feat to take a specific spell that isn't natively on the list, and now you can have two extra sources of damage for your uh, longbow attack. Yeah. Real overpowered. 1d8 plus 2d6. Really overpowered. Yeah. I would like to cast Fireball at 5th level. <laughs> that, that's the thing. Like, marshals need a buff. Which, one of, one of uh, the YouTubers I like to watch is a, a min-maxer, power gamer kind of type pack tactics. And he has long... He has been for a long time... Uh, complaining about the lack of power from martial classes when compared to spellcasters mm-hmm. and it shit like this people being like oh at level five 1d8 plus 2d6 plus your dex twice is way too powerful or at level one level one yeah level one two weapon fighting up in melee 2d6 plus 2d6 plus your dex once is too powerful it's strong Outside of level one and maybe level two, it evens out real fucking quick. Mm-hmm. And once you hit level five, spellcasters fall off. They spellcasters go classic hockey stick in power, and then marshals just kind of continue on their slow level progression. So I think uh, they can suck it. This ranger is awesome. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> the rogue. The rogue. Lar- largely unchanged. The rogue is beloved by most people. They've streamlined a couple things, but it's pretty much unchanged. There was one debuff that I know a lot of people have been complaining about, but we'll get there in just a second. Uh, they get three first level features, expertise in two skills of your choice. They suggest sleight of hand and stealth, classic. Thieves can't, you learn the thieves can't language. It is now a language instead of just an additional thing. Yep. And an additional language of your choice. Yes, that is a buff to the Thieves Can't feature. And then Sneak Attack. When you take the attack action, you can deal extra damage 
to one creature you hit with an attack roll. If you're attacking with a finesse weapon or a ranged weapon and you meet one of the two requirements, you either have advantage on the attack or you have an ally within five feet and you don't have disadvantage on the attack or are not incapacitated. So this is where I've heard a lot of people, or some people complain because they've changed the wording and it says once on each of your turns. Whereas previously it was just once per turn. So in 2014 version, uh, you could sneak attack on an opportunity attack. Now it's on your turn. I, it's niche. It's niche. It's a build that you have to build around to get a, a additional ways to trigger opportunity attacks. And yeah, a lot of roguish ar- uh, archetypes had had some cool ways of doing that. But if they wanted to change it back and just made it once per turn, I think that's fine. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not too chuffed about it either way. And secondarily, because of the neck of the one of the very very powerful second level features cunning action which also takes your reaction to have uh or sorry not cunning action uh we're actually up to fifth uh, i'm up to fifth level but uncanny dodge where you use your reaction to have the damage of an attack roll that takes a lot of uh that takes a lot of ra- uh, rogues uh reaction there yeah. so so uh, and by the time you get to fifth level are you using your reaction for every opportunity attack as a rogue maybe maybe not yeah um it's a very niche thing, and if that's what people are complaining about, then I think the rogue's in a good spot in this playtest. Second level, you get cunning action. As a bonus action, you can use dash, disengage, or hide. Exactly the same. Rogue subclass feature at level 3, exactly the same. Feet at level 4. Fifth level, uncanny dodge. Use your reaction when you get hit with an attack roll to have the attacks of damage against you. You round down. That is the same. Exact same. Sixth level subclass feature, seventh level, you get a second instance of expertise and two skills of your choice. Eighth level, you get a feat. Ninth level, you get evasion. Which is delayed from seventh level of the 2014 version. A bit of a debuff. It's fine. Again, the expertise, expert class, their expertise is a big part of that. Yeah. And so they're moving to put all the experts on the same level. On the same level, you're getting expertise at the same time across the board. I think that's fine. Evasion, half damage when you make a dexterity saving throw. If you fail, no damage if you succeed on the saving throw. 10th level, you get a feat. 10th level, you also get a subclass feat. Subclass and a feat at the same level. 10th level is going to be good for a rogue. Mm-hmm. 11th level, reliable talent. When you make an ability check that uses one of your skill or tool proficiencies, you can te- you can treat a d20 roll of 9 or lower as a 10. Same? Same as before. 12th level, you get a feat. 13th level, this is a brand new one. Mm-hmm. Subtle strikes. When you attack, you know how to exploit a target's distraction. You have advantage on any attack roll that targets a creature that is within 5 feet of at least one of your allies who is not incapacitated. We were speaking of pack tactics just a minute ago. Yeah. And this is pa- this is the this, this is, is the feature called pack tactics. This is pack tactics to a T. And you don't have to be within five feet, so you can still get your sneak attack with a longbow or a crossbow, mm-hmm. as long as you are shooting at someone close. And it is consistent, easy advantage. Yep. Which means consistent and easy crits. Which means consistent and easy double damage. On the weapon, not the sneak attack dice, which I'm still salty about. That still needs to change. Crits should just double all the dice, especially for marshals. Moving on. This is replacing blind sense, which is just 10-foot blind sight. This is better, I think. Oh, this um, is decidedly better. Because, yeah, again, that rogues want to stay out of combat. And it's going to come up a lot more. Oh, yeah. 14th level, subclass feet. 15th level, slippery mind. You gain proficiency in wisdom. And charisma saving throws. It used to only be wisdom. I correct, believe. correct. So, straight up buff to Slippery Mind, and I believe at the same level? Yep. 15th. 16th level, you get a feat. 17th level, you get elusive. No attack roll has advantage against you while you aren't incapacitated. And that's accelerated from 2014, where you get elusive at 18th level. Mm. Yeah. Big, big nerf for the rogue. <laughs> 18th level, you get Stroke of Luck. If you fail a d20 test, you can turn the roll into a 20. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest. Yeah. 20th level feature, now at 18th. Yeah. 19th level, you get a feat. 20th level, you get an epic boon. They suggest the epic boon of undetectability, or another of your choice. The subclass they provide here is the Thief. The Thief, I think, is better in most every way than the 2014 PHB Thief. Third level, you have fast hands. You have additional options for your bonus action when you are using your cunning action. You can take the search action, 
which is a new action. Mm -hmm. Or you can make a dexterity sleight of hand check to pick a lock or lock or disarm a trap using your thieves tools or to pick a pocket. Third level, you also get second story work. You gain a climb speed equal to your speed. When you take the jump action, you can make a dexterity check instead of a strength check. These are the same, just better worded. Yeah. And I think second story work is simplified from the nonsense that it had to now you just have a climb speed. You gain a climb speed faster than normal. Climbing no longer costs extra movement is what it is worded in 2014. So now you just get climbing speed, which is much more elegant. In, in Indubitably. Sixth level, you get supreme sneak. You have advantage on every stealth check you make, provided you are not wearing medium or heavy armor. Uh, so this was Supreme Sneak came uh, in 2014 at ninth level and said you have advantage on stealth checks if you did not move more than half of your speed on your turn. Oh, so another buff for the rogue. <laughs> you Big. can't you can go all the way across the room and hide <laughs> as long as you're not in that fucking plate mail. Yeah. Tenth level, use magic device. You can attune to up to four magic items at once. Whenever you use a magic item property that expends a charge, roll a d6. If you roll a 6, you use the property without expending the charge. And you can use any spell scroll that bears a cantrip or a first level spell. You can also try to use any spell scroll that contains a higher level spell, but you must first succeed on a intelligence arcana check. The DC equal to 10 plus your spell's level on a successful check. You can cast the spell from the scroll and you use the intelligence as your spell casting ability for this casting. On a failed check, the scroll disintegrates. If you're a thief, take your expertise in Arcana. There you go. So this, again, is replacing use magic device. Uh, the 2014 version, you now ignore all uh, race, class, and level requirements to use magic items. A bit of a nerf. There weren't but... that many magical items. Like, okay, so dwarven oh. thrower, you had to be a dwarf. Or, yeah. And the, uh, the fey magic shard stone had to be a sorcerer. Yeah, and the, the paladin sword. The holy avenger. The holy avenger, you had to be a paladin. But that's very niche. It's very niche. And I'd much rather be able to attune to a fourth item. item. And possibly be able to use your magic items charges without expending the charge. Oh, yeah. So you occasionally just get a freebie. And you can just use any spell scroll now. And if you have expertise in Arcana, you're very easily going to be double digits in your Arcana skill, meaning you have a well more than 50% chance to cast any level spell. Mm -hmm. I think that's cool. I'm cool with it. 14th level Thieves Reflexes. You can now take a second bonus action on your turn, provided it is the bonus action from Cunning Action. You can use this feature a number of turns equal to your proficiency bonus and you regain all expended uses when you finish our long rest what the fuck so here's the big nerf the yeah. big nerf for the thief which was when <laughs> you reach in thief if you reach 17th level uh you take two turns on the first round of combat the first being on your initiative and the second being 10 place or 10 initiative places lower or 10 your initiative minus 10 yeah um Eh, it's fine. Look, okay, yes, that is that's very powerful. Who's who's getting to seventeenth level thief rogue? No offense. This fourteenth level ability, fourteenth level uh, here at seventeenth oh. in twenty fourteen. Oh. Twenty fourteen at seventeenth level. Here it's fourteenth level. And honestly, I like having two two cunning actions. Two cunning actions. That's a dash, a, a disengage, dash or a hide. It's a that is a disengage and a hide. That is disengage, regular movement, and hide. Or that's... Double dash. Dash, triple dash, 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 movement. <laughs> like, triple dash plus movement. Like, if you have 30-foot movement, if you have a 30-foot walking speed, you don't have a buff to it anywhere else. Once per day, you can just bolt 120 feet. Well, four times a day. Four times a day? Four times a day. Fuck, man. In... <laughs> in 24 seconds, you can move 480 feet. That's fucked. <laughs> I think this is fine. I'm totally okay with this. Oh yeah. I don't think I don't think it's a nerf or a buff. I think it is a lateral move because it's a lesser ability, but it's three levels sooner, and you're gonna get a lot more uses out of it, and it's more casually useful. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Rogue overall, largely unchanged. A uh, couple nerfs, a couple buffs. Some lateral movements. Lateral movements. I like it. It's fine. Yeah. 
the next section and we're an hour and a half in so these next sections I feel like we have less to talk about anyway the feats yes, no. the feats um, pretty much all of the fourth level feats are half feats now so like most things got a buff actor athlete dual wielder buff nerf because it doesn't get um, plus one to your AC anymore crossbow expert is largely unchanged and it's a half feat uh, defensive duelist you get a parry durable is a half feat and you get advantage on death saves now and de- durable is a bit different elemental adept is largely the same pulling up elemental adept previously yeah it's the same, it's just worded yeah. different. Uh, epic boons are pretty much exactly the same as presented in the Dungeon Master's Guide. They are listed as 20th level feats. They do now, of course, have the prerequisite of your class group, thank you. Yes. Um, eh, they're fine, most of them. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I in some cases, because you don't have to take an epic boon, you can take just a regular feat instead at 20th level, and for some characters it might just be better to take a feat. Honestly, I think as look, I read through these and I was like, most of these, as a dungeon master, if we're getting to twentieth level, I'm going to homebrew you a special epic boon because these Absolutely. are these pretty are mid. These are pretty mid. Decidedly mid. Uh, there's a bunch of fighting style feats: defense, dueling, great weapon fighting, protection, and two weapon fighting. You can now take as a feat. Uh, grappler. I don't even want to get into it. Now the ones that I am going to get into. Great Weapon Master and Sharpshooter. No longer can you take a minus 5 to attack for a plus 10 to damage. Power gamers and min-maxers and fans of those features, such as myself, are a bit upset. Um, you did a whole video on the, on, on taking I minus did, 5. I did, I did an entire video about how to most effectively use Great Weapon Master and Sharpshooter on the YouTubes. Go check it out. And I'm of two minds. Because they're half feats now. They are half feats. And you get all of the other things. Particularly with Great Weapon Master, you can you still get a bonus action attack when you score a critical hit or reduce a creature to zero. And they gain the feature when you hit with a heavy weapon as part of your attack action on your turn, you can cause the weapon to deal extra damage to the target equal to your proficiency bonus, and you can deal it once per turn. So it's more consistent damage. Mm-hmm. So Great Weapon Master, I feel like, is the lesser offender. Sharpshooter is largely unchanged, just without the minus five for plus ten damage. You ignore half and three quarters cover. You don't have the main thing that it added was you don't have disadvantage when using a ranged attack within five feet. Yeah, that so was taking the... that one thing from Crossbow Expert and moving it onto Sharpshooter as well. Which, as Crossbow Expert goes, they did modify that one to where previously was just that generic any range weapon to now crossbow specific. I wouldn't be surprised if they added in feats that were just melee and ranged versions of minus... You can take minus five to the roll for plus ten damage and splitting the feats. Which... Or maybe even just give up so much to your attack roll to add it to your your damage roll. Maybe. So, Um, TBD... I will say there are, and I know that they need to be here, kind of, but the um, armor feats. Armor feats. Um, they're not... They're not they're as bad, but they're not. They're still not great. A lot of people... Now, they did make the, I believe it was the medium armor. The medium armor master? Uh, no, not that one. Oh, Heavy it's armor. Uh, simple. The, the, oh, the lightly armored. Lightly armored, yes. It's a first level feat. You gain pr- armor training, which by the way, you don't gain proficiency. No armor anymore because you don't add your proficiency. Bonus it has nothing to do with proficiency. <laughs> it's just a weird term change. It's just armor training now. You gain it in light armor, medium armor, and shields. It is a first level feat noted. So there's a lot of people that are like, one of the points that Pack Tactics makes in his video is marshals need a buff really bad when compared to the spellcasting curve for damage. And then they give spellcasters access to medium armor shields at level one. Mm-hmm. Because first level feats you can take with your background. Yep. So I don't know quite how I feel about that yet. Um, we'll have to see how it plays out and what the community thinks, I would say. 
Uh, Keen Mind seems Keen Mind freaking sweet. Got completely overhauled. Oh, yeah. Um, whereas before, of course, Keen Mind was, hey, DM, tell me what I want to know. Uh, it's now uh, you can take, you gain, you can gain proficiency or expertise in investigation and uh, you get to take the study action as a bonus action. Mm -hmm. Inspiring leader at the end of a short or long rest you can choose up to six creatures friendly, including yourself within 30 feet and they all gain 2d4 plus your proficiency bonus temporary hit points. As opposed to your level plus your charisma modifier. So a little bit of a nerf on the max side. But at lower levels... Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. It's also a half feet now. Yeah, it's a half feet. That's another thing you got to take. A lot of these are... Pretty much all of these are half feats. Uh, anything else sticks out to you? A polar master, you still have your bonus action attack. That's a d4. You can still uh, use your reaction to make a melee attack against a creature that enters your reach when you use a weapon that has the heavy and reach properties. And it's a half feet now. Um, ritual caster is a bit better... Uh, Sentinel is pretty much unchanged. Shield Master is really good. Uh, Shield Bash. There's a new one, uh, Speedster. Mm. <laughs> uh, fourth level feet, prerequisite de uh, dexterity constitution of 13 plus. Rune's not repeatable. Uh, you possess exceptional speed and stamina, and you gain the following benefits of you increase your uh, dex or con by one, and you increase your speed by 10 feet if you aren't wearing heavy armor, and when you taste dash action, you can ignore difficult terrain. That's pretty cool. I still think Spell Sniper needs to come with a cantrip that you can use with an attack roll with it. Um, but they it's slightly buffed. Warcaster, largely unchanged. Weapon training, you gain martial weapon proficiencies. Which, of course, as, as we know, I used to rage against Weapon Expert, which just gave you four uh, proficiency in four, or Weapons Master, you gain proficiency in four weapons of your choice. Each one must be simple or a martial weapon. Uh, that's stupid in the 2014. I'm more fine with just you gain martial weapon proficiencies. What? We get to spells. We're not going to go over the entire spell list. That's I want ludicrous. you to read. The entire spell list. That's ludicrous. Word for word. Fuck that. <laughs> uh, you get all the spells in the player's handbook for arcane, primal, and um, divine from first from cantrip all the way up to ninth level. Notably absent is still the beloved Eldritch Blast. Blast. And uh, there were some spells that changed what school of magic they were in. Um, there's the class of spell that was changed so that the bard can still use it. Shatter, Thunder Wave, and Earthquake were changed from evocation to transmutation. Blindness, Deafness was changed from necromancy to transmutation. And then abjuration to transmutation, Stone Skin. There were also a couple other changes. Uh, a lot of healing spells were changed from evocation to abjuration. Cure Wounds, Healing Words, Prayer of Healing, Aura of Vitality, Mass Healing Word, Hallow, Mass Cure Wounds, Mass Heal, Power Word, Heal. Uh, and then some other ones that just kind of made a little bit of sense and just kind of changed around things a little bit. Sending and telepathy went from evocation to divination. Contingency went from evocation to abjuration. Glibness went from transmutation to enchantment. Reincarnation went from transmutation to necromancy. Conjuration to evocation went the way of produce flame and flaming sphere. Fine. I'm sure we'll we'll see more why they did that when we get to the mages and the priests. We'll need to be building, yeah, some heavy casters here to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. Ability checks. We're getting to the rules glossary now. Ability checks is a type of D20 test. They go over skills and then action required, such as hide and influence, include the, which by the way, the influence action, not a fan of. They go over difficulty class, give some breakdowns, e very easy being 5, easy being 10, yada, yada, yada. Armor training is the new armor proficiency. It functions exactly the same. They changed the name simply because it does not use proficiency bonus, so why would it be a proficiency? Artisan's tools, it's now 15 gold. There is, um, we're, we're going to skip a couple here because one, again, we're getting a little down. Attack rolls. Um, there is a note here, attack roll. The attack roll is one of the three types of d20 tests. The unearth this unearthed arcana article uses the rules for attacking and critical hits found in the 2014 player's handbook. Critical hits are reverted. I was wrong. Yay. 
Okay, you can crit on sneak attack. Very good. Yes. Very good. I had a friend point that out to me the other Very day, good. and I was like, oh, okay, there. Thank the Lord. Thank Jesus. Yeah. Uh, bark skin is noted here. It is a second level transmutation spell. It is a primal. It is now a bonus action to cast. Concentration up to one hour. Touch a willing creature to protect it with regenerating bark. Willing creature can include yourself, by the way. Till the spell ends, the target's skin assumes bark-like appearance, and at the start of each of the target's turns, the target gains a number of temporary hit points equal to your spellcasting ability modifier plus your proficiency bonus. When you upcast it, you can target an additional willing creature for each slot level above second. You can now use bark skin on yourself as a ranger, mm -hmm. and it's better. Yeah, it's a little bit uh, closer yeah. to uh, heroism. It's and a, it's a primal action. heroism. Some description on blindsight, including the in hidden and invisible f uh, conditions. Climb speed, creature type, d20 test, dash action, difficult terrain explanation, some examples of when you would get difficult terrain, the exhaustion condition. So as we were mentioning earlier, uh, the exhaustion used to be a six level table that started with every, every time you got on a level in exhaustion, you got a new debuff. Uh, here, it's very much uh, more simplified where um, it's 10 levels and for every level you... Uh, um, sorry. For every level, uh, you subtract your exhaustion level from any of your D twenty test rolls. Fascinating. So instead of having disadvantage on all skill checks at level one and having half one. move at level two, and at level six you die. Now it's minus, minus 10. ten. Attack rolls. Ability checks, saving throws. Minus 10 is fucked. That's a lot. That's a lot. Your spell save DCs. You subtract exhaustion level from your spell save DCs, too. Jeez. Yo, that's fucked. <laughs> <laughs> if they add this to, like, creatures inflicting levels of exhaustion, like, if you get up to six, like, you're fucked. You can get in a death spiral real quick. Oh, yeah. Which I think is the point without out outright killing you. Explains expertise, explains fly speed, gaming sets now cost a gold apiece. The grappled condition, pretty much unchanged. I think it's weird that the grappled condition also applies the slowed condition, if you move them. It's weird. <laughs> uh, guidance is updated. Guidance is uh, a bit controversial now. Everyone loves spamming guidance right now. Bonus action. It is a reaction which you take in response to you or an ally within 30 feet of you failing an ability check. Creature rolls a d4 and adds that number to the check, possibly turning it into a success. Once a creature rolls the die for this spell, that creature cannot benefit from the spell again until the creature finishes a long rest. Feels like a bit of an arbitrary addition. Yeah. If you want it to be more reactionary and less spammy just inform dms to use it a bit differently and say no yeah a lot of the problems that they're trying to design rules around and limitations around that are frustrating and annoying would be better served if they just explained that dms sometimes need to say no you cannot yeah i mean we definitely have seen in uh, critical role where they learned about guidance basically last campaign and, and it got know. very spammy and i love it and it's definitely having it's it's taken off in the community where before it was seen as shit. Yeah. Um. And so, is it a problem? Probably not. Like you said, just tell people how you know help people how run the, how help people run the game and you know learn how to you know be be at the table. The help action they explain pretty much exactly the same. Heroic inspiration. You now gain inspiration when you roll a one and not a twenty. As with the last Unearthed Arcana, which I think is interesting, that you fail so miserably bad that you are like, now I don't want to, I'm embarrassed. I don't want to fuck up like that ever again. So now I really am going to make sure that I don't. Yeah, we, we, I've seen this in other TTRPGs where it's like, oh, you roll the lowest. So now you've learned something. And so your next time you get better. Mm -hmm. Uh, the hidden condition was added simply to better explain what happens when you successfully hide. And, and it's one of those things where... I think by explaining it, they made it too convoluted. Yeah. I, Before... It was, it was more elegant when it was... As we, as I said earlier, some of these things that they're trying to create mechanics for are better when the vagueness is left in. Mm-hmm. 
do they perceive you? Yes or no? Are you then you're hidden? That's as simple as it needs to be, really. The hide action, basically, like you are hidden. <laughs> they also specifically say set the DC to hiding at a uh, DC fifteen while heavily obscured or behind three quarters cover. It, it they're codifying it too much. Yes. Incapacitated so- condition. They. You're knocked out. Stop it. Yeah. The my least favorite thing that they've added, the influence action. That goes over a chart of attitudes that NPCs might have towards your character, indifferent, friendly, and hostile, interactions, and then it gives different possible DCs for DM like fuck all this. Get rid of it. Scrap it. So here's the thing. I've seen people talk about this before as as homebrew of treating indifferent, friendly, or hostile as different levels of like cover. Like just okay, so if they're you know, if if you go up to a creature and it's hostile towards you, okay, now you add you know plus five, you know, add five to the DC or subtract five from their roll or whatever. If they're friendly to you, then you know, maybe get a plus. It doesn't. Again, it's one of those things where they codified it. And now it's just clunky. Now it's clunky. I. It takes up an entire page. And to the, say do social interactions. And the fact that they make it an action makes the I want to talk someone into it more gamified I like I take the influence action is now something that you can say mm-hmm. like it's not role play based it's not like no get rid of the influence action not a fan scrap it entirely the invisible condition change the wording on it jump action still sucks jumping still sucks and it's also an action now yeah Light weapon property. Ding, 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 ding. Hello, two weapon fighting buff. When you are attacking with a weapon that has the light property and you have another light weapon in your offhand, you can make an attack with it as part of the same attack action and you do not add your ability modifier to the extra attack's damage. So instead of making an attack as an action and then using your bonus action to attack, you make an attack as an action and then you just get the other attack without having to use your bonus action. Straight buff for two weapon fighting. There's also been a buff... Oh, here you go. My beloved ranger. Yes. You can now, at first level... At first level... Bonus action. Hunter's mark. Action attack. Two weapon fighting. Other attack. That's what people are complaining about. Because you get 2d6 plus 2d6 for the two attacks. And then you get your ability modifier once. Plus your dex. So you're getting 4d6 plus your dex at level 1. If you hit. If you hit. Twice. Fuck off. It's fine. Shut up. Uh, next is the long rest, which... Maybe miss it, but there is a slight buff in there where you regain all of your hit die on a long rest, as opposed to you regain up to half of your hit die. Now there's even... they Now they really need to give us more reasons to use the fucking hit die, though. They do. We, we saw that a little bit. A little bit. They need more. Uh, there's not the cast a spell action. There is the magic Action, magic action which combines the cast a spell action and use a magic item action into one that is just magic now whatever right same shit different name movement they talk about it climbing flying swimming codifying things a little bit too much musical instruments now cost 20 gold a piece uh, ritual casting Blah de blah de blah. The search action. You can make a wisdom check to discern something that isn't obvious. Search table suggests which skills are applicable when you take this action. Insight for a creature's state of mind. Medicine for a creature's ailments. Perception for a concealed creature or object. Survival for tracks or food. <sighs> this is basically t- uh, this is basically a way for you to say, DM, I want to make a roll. Instead of... Same with the... We'll get to... Late, we'll just do it now. The study action, which is basically the same for arcana, history, investigation, nature, and religion. Why is investigation the study action? It's the, the search, search action. action. Why is medicine the search action and not the study action? Why do these actions exist in the first place? You're, you're, you're telling your DM, do I want to make a wisdom check or do I want to make an intelligence check? How about you just ask your dm to make the check that you want to make 
I will say there is there is some uh, uh, people in the community who don't like that. I we are not of that mind, especially because I can explain my my what what my character is doing to you all day, and you can just miss it because we have people yeah. talking over here. And so I I I'm not opposed to my player saying, "Can I make an Arcana check?" or "Can I make him?" I want to look at this body. Can I make a medicine check? Because I have proficiency in medicine. Yeah. And then I will tell them yes or no. Because if you tell them that, then you can be like, "No, it makes more sense for you to do this check." Again, they're putting into rules things that didn't need to be codified in an attempt to make it easier for DMs instead of just explaining to DMs, tell your players no and tell them what you think they should do instead. Maybe not tell them what to do. Yeah. Like if you, it, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't make sense for you to make a history check right here. I think you should make an arcana check instead. Whatever. Slowed condition, yeah. Swim speed, yeah. Teleportation, don't know why it's here. It doesn't provo- provoke opportunity attacks. Tremor sense, yeah. Unarmed strikes, same as previous. Well. And that is the 38 page Unearthed Arcana expert classes. We're finally getting classes. Between the two, you can now make a character and play them. Yes. With the new rules. And with the spell lists available, even though only two of them have really been changed. There are two that you can use that are that are applicable for the bard and the ranger. Give it a try. Please tell us. We have. I'm going to hopefully in the near future be making an entire one D and D channel in our Discord, which you can join via the mm-hmm. link tree in the bio of pretty much all of our things to tell us what you think and your experiences if you try out one D and D or simply your thoughts on one D and D. Additionally, Wizards of the Coast on October twentieth will be dropping this uh, this Unearthed Arcana spells or survey. Uh, those usually go for about two weeks, so uh, hop in there and tell Wizards what you think. Please actually do that. That is the way they actually hear you. That is the way that you can get your voice heard and affect change. Complaining on Twitter, complaining in YouTube comments, complaining on TikTok comments is not how to get it done. You Making a podcast it. about it and exactly. and talking to five pe- <laughs> six people in the in the comments. <laughs> Listen, you don't need to call us out. Speaking of, well, let, let me go through the rigmarole. Let me go through the rigmarole. Again, you can subscribe to us on the YouTubes. The YouTube spell point video for Warlocks. It's blowing up. Highly recommend. The Great Weapon Master, you won't be able to do a minus five for a plus ten, but you can learn how to do that right now and why that's so awesome. You can subscribe to us there. We post the podcast there, as well as on podcast services around the globe. Apple, Google, Spotify, uh, uh, Fanta bottles. Fanta soda dispensers. Uh, oh, the the Coca Cola style, uh, yes. choose your style yeah, machines. The, the Coca Cola freestyle. Freestyle, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, you can watch our podcast on that. Um, it'll take like five to ten seconds on a delay when you touch it to do that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that's fine. It's got a process. It's got its whole process. And remember, a lot of other people have touched that machine. Uh, if you wash your hands, please do. If you enjoyed our draft at the beginning of this episode. You can follow us on Instagram, where Sam's going to be posting the poll in the near future, after this podcast goes live, where you can vote on who had the better draft of candy. I yet again think I have objectively the better squad. I think you're always going to think that. I don't know. There's some of those topics that I feel like I'm definitely going to get clobbered in, and that's okay. All right. I'm I'm still salty about the board games thing. You were playing to a specific audience. I was. I feel like this is a bit more ambiguous. This is a lot, yeah. You can't play to an audience here. I think I definitely had the upper hand with the Reese's Cup pick. You did. I think I was pretty sly. I was, was going to choose the Reese's Cup if you didn't. I was sly with the Snickers pick. I the feel Snickers like I is a good pick. One in. I feel like the Sour Patch Kids pick was a pretty good value add. Um, the Skittles was a great pick. I never would have thought to pick the Skittles, but that, that, was, that was a very solid pick. It was also the only piece candy we... It was. It was. The M&M's. And the I Reese's think that speaks. I, I'm, I was wondering, I was, go, I was like, should I go with my head or my heart for my fifth pick? My head said peanut M&M's. Ooh. My heart, my heart said I need to call out the fucking coconut haters and bring in the Almond Joy in the mound just to piss them off. Which if I lose, that's what I'm going to attribute it to. And that is going to be a, uh, a loss that I will happily accept because people are wrong. Those are delicious. And uh, just to continue the rigmarole here, uh, Sprig and Glenn earlier asked, what is your stream schedule? Uh, when we, when we have do- time. <laughs> <laughs> Once every two weeks, usually. Yes. Uh, we tend, So we post the podcast every other week on Wednesdays. And we tend to record sometime between Thursday and Sunday, leading into that Wednesday. Mm-hmm. So it's there. 
we're trying to be better about making the events on the Discord and the TikTok so that if you see our videos, you can see when we schedule those. Um, I did that this morning <laughs> as of recording this, so it was for up for like six hours. But, you know, we're working on it. Um, before we get to the TikTok live chat, which we have, I'm sure have plenty of things and plenty of comments and thoughts about this one D&D, I want to bring up, we give preferential treatment to the members of our Discord. You can write in any podcast in the podcast questions channel of our Discord server. Link in Linktree in the bio. Open to all to join. Mm -hmm. Where over 230 of you already do join. And one of our good Discord uh, brethren who likes to run some games over there, DK Alexander, gave some thoughts on his preliminary thoughts on 1D&D overall. He says, I've only read through briefly... This seems like streamlined rules while also opening options up for customization. Trying to shove my inner grognard down on some of the new wording. Same. Hmm. But I'd get over it eventually. It's honestly the 3 to 3.5 all over again, which is no complaint. 3.5 made 3rd edition not suck. And there are still many, many people out there who love and play third edition. Um, and three point five. And uh, yeah, and three point five. That's why I'm at three point five. They love and play third uh, three point five, very consistently. Um, I I have talked to people who are like who have mentioned recent three point five games that they start or are playing in, um, and and kind of the same boat. I'm sure, especially for, you know, one D and D is supposed to drop in twenty twenty four. Yeah. Um, I'm sure far into 2027 we'll still be having people being like do you want to join my 5e game or do you want to join my 5.5 game you know that sort of thing or whatever they actually end up calling it (laughs) we'll call it whatever we damn well please yeah now at last sam is there anything in the chat there's a lot yeah we've had a a lot of candy conversation this week i I, what what were were some highlights of things that we forgot let's see here we go. As a reminder, Sam's Draft is the classic Hershey's chocolate bar, the Skittles, the Cadbury egg, a great pick, the Three Musketeers, a controversial one. I like the Three Musketeers, but I feel like other people won't, and the Tootsie Pop. My draft was the classic, the OG, the obvious number one overall pick of the Reese's Cup, mm-hmm. followed mm-hmm. by the Snickers, followed by the Kit Kat, followed by the Sour Patch Kids, followed by the Owl, the Mal, the Mound. <laughs> Slash almond. So like. bad he can't actually We've say it. We've been talking for two hours, <laughs> my guy. Um, so there was a lot of conversation around the Cadbury egg, uh, including a lot of people who have never actually had one. Oh, they're downright delectable. Um, apparently there are new fruit Cadbury eggs. Oh, I, now I love a, a chocolate covered strawberry, so I can see the appeal, but I am concerned. Would need to try. Right. It depend on that inner, like, how are they doing that? Uh, taken for granted says, I think that the sugar cream in the middle is that what's turning me off. Uh, they prefer a Hershey's cookies and cream. Huh. I've never been a fan of the Hershey's cookies and cream chocolate bar. Or cream bar with chocolate chunks. I've not, I've not been huge on that either. I do remember there was a, stre- when I was young, my mother would always buy, in my youth, in my youth my mother would always buy those big bags of like the mini candy bars and put them in a tin. And then after dinner, we were always allowed to have one. I like those mini candy bars, by the way. And for a long time, there must have been a sale where we had the cookies and cream Hershey's. And I really, it, I, I ate so many back then, I couldn't even. Now, a pro tip. The only time I've ever enjoyed them has been you take the little square. And I'm not a big hot liquid fan. But in the rare event that I indulge myself in a hot chocolate. Hmm. Dumping, up, dumping one of those in there, letting it melt. Gets a little bit more cream in there. You get the little chocolatey chunks in there. I think it could also do okay on a s'mores instead of just some normal Ooh, chocolate. I could see the appeal of that. Not really for me, per se, but I can definitely... I can see that, yeah. I, could get, I get that appeal. Uh, Beardick points out that the Sour Patch Kid sounds like an awesome, awesome minion for a bad guy in a game. <sighs> Very good. Oh, an ooze minion. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, uh, there call... is in Stibbles. There's the gummy bear oozes. We need to call up. Uh, we need to call him up for a, a Stibbles, uh, like DLC. <laughs> <laughs> Some Stibbles DLC, the Sour Patch variant of the gummy bear. Hey Logan, we just missed you at Gen Con. We did. We re- we quite literally did. We had 
your we, your buddy was rooming with him. Yeah, we we knew a guy. We we knew a guy who knew a guy. Really, actually, we just knew a guy. Yeah, that knew you. So, sorry. Um, taken for granted. Says mounds are good, almonds are evil. Mounds are great. Thank you. There was quite a bit of discussion about the licking to get to the center of a tootsie pop. Well over three hundred <laughs> established. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Um, some interesting suggestions to oh, put onto the. My lord. What? I've had my mic muted for I don't know how long. Well, guess we're hoping that mom picked you up. Yep. Yep. That's that's unfortunate. That is an unfortunate development. I was looking at the waveforms. I'm like, why is mine so little? And yours is not. <sighs> well, moving on. Um, it, it's never simple, is it? It never just works. So, um, a little, little discussion from Bardic. Uh, taken for granted. Uh is Bardic Inspiration uh, a buff? Uh, they are asking. Yes. Um, they prefer the 10 minutes as a bonus action, plus the Bard lost a ton of spells. Um, I don't. I honestly don't think they've lost all that many spells. I'm not honestly. sure. We haven't added it up. It'd... We haven't looked into it deeply, but I mean, a lot of the Bard list was utility casting and healing. They get healing. Just they get it. And, I think, and a couple of the bard staples that they wouldn't have had access to changed schools of magic so that pretty much so the bard could get access to them. And plus the bard now being a prepared caster um, instead of swapping a out. yeah swapping out. I, I think the spell casting pool is a wash. And uh, yeah, bardic inspiration is a buff. Hmm. All right. Uh, Jay Westall 20 says, I'm new to D&D as a player, but I've watched Critical Role. Us too. Same. Um, they've only played one time. Congratulations. Ah, uh, so we pointed out that the Bardic Inspiration could be used for healing. Mm-hmm. And that it's going to, uh, save your, your, your melees or whoever is going down. And, uh, the question was, wouldn't a player just go right back down if there's multiple enemies? Well, here's the thing. The only hit point that's important is in D&D one. is the last one. You have no, di- you, like, your character doesn't function any differently between max and and one hit point and so as long as they're up and not making death saving throws they are fine mm-hmm. that's and that's a big thing too with when a, for example enemies turn your fighters turn your turn is the bard on the enemy's turn they hit the fighter the fighter goes unconscious previously the fighter's turn would happen you have to make they would have to make a death saving throw possibly failing it then it would become your turn. You use your bonus action to healing ward them, for example, and then they get up. And then by the time it gets back around to the enemy, the enemy has a chance to hit him again and knock him out again. With Bardic Inspiration now as a reaction, when they take that damage, you can heal them back up so they don't fall unconscious. So then they can take their turn immediately after, and then you can heal them up more if you wanted, or simply wait for them to get hit again so that you can bring them back up. It, it's straight up just better. It's more utility, a shocking amount of utility that I was not expecting. <laughs> it's also one of those things where as um, I see this as we've started to play magic more, we think about how effects are going to stack or get onto the stack. Mm-hmm. And that's one mm-hmm. of those major things yeah. where where a lot of people might not grasp at. But as, as the fact that we're like consuming magic 24 seven now, it's like on the stack is damaged. The damage happens. All right, we're going to hit. It. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Moving on. The mighty muck says, how do I start best as a baby GM and low, with low experience player uh, and a low experience player? Get into it. Grab the Dragons of Stormwreck Isle. Or if you want to go on to D&D, uh, dndbeyond.com, you can pick up the Lost Minds of Fandelver for free. free. There's a lot of free options. Uh, grab something pre-written. And if you've really never played D&D before and you need to learn like rules... There's a lot of good use, uh, resources on YouTube. I learned from uh, how-to videos from do from Don't Stop Thinking, mm-hmm. uh, animation style that was really good. You can watch. Uh, there's a bunch of live plays that you can learn the rules passively through Dimension Twenty and Critical Role. There's a million small ones. Mm-hmm. Um, you learned from MCDM Matt Colville, yeah, an, another great resource. So 
If you need to learn how to play D&D, start with that. If you need to learn how to DM and you know the rules of D&D already, grab, and you're interested in the Dragons of Stormwreck Isle, I would recommend that as the newest thing. Uh, you can get Lost Minds of Fandelver, which was the previous starter adventure on D&D Beyond for free, as well as a whole bunch of other adventures that are pre-written for free on D&D Beyond. And if you want to just do a little baby one, there's a whole bunch of... Uh, you can get The Frozen Sick, which is one of the level 1 to 3 adventures from Wildmount for free on D&D Beyond. And they also have, this is from a while ago, they used to do Encounters of the Week, mm -hmm. which is just a simple one single encounter, sometimes a session that's just pre-written and built for you. And you can just do it. And if you want to flex your muscles a little bit and get some get some practice in, it's always good to exercise those muscles. Uh, you can hop into our Discord and throw out there that hey, I'm a new DM and would love to learn to uh, love to run a Discord game for a couple players for the first time. Yes, we have a lot of good people in there who I'm sure would be loved to play there's, and there's, help you out. There's a lot that want to play, not a want, not a lot that want to run. So, mm -hmm. would be very welcome in the Discord server. Link in the link tree in the bio. Free and open to all to join and play. Right. The Pirate Tom says, hey, what's up, fellas? Hey, what's up, Pirate Tom? Hey, what's up, Pirate Tom? Um, Pirate Tom donated some lovely things for our fundraiser for oh, Pop Lichen. We love it. was Pop. wonderful. Very active in that Discord channel and helping out. Thank you, Pop. Thank you, Pirate. Thank you, Pirate. Thank you, Pirate. R. R, indeed. Uh, Good, sir. Sprig and Glenn says... Uh, point out to the tabaxi um, as a as a race have a racial feature that they can move up to uh, use a movement action as a free action once um, on one of their turns. It does have a recharge of oh, you can't move on your next turn, but with the thief, a 14th level thief tabaxi, you could move not just 120 feet, you can move 150 feet. Nice. Four times a day as long as you take a six second breather in between. Nah, that's fine. Um, they have one more question. Okay. It's basically your thoughts on my current D&D &D character, who's an Emerald Dragonborn, a fighter, Echo Knight, Paladin, Oath of the Conqueror, with a Dragonic Roar feet. He's on a, he's only a baby level two, but I'm not sure how to level him should he not die in the adventure. Well, Echo Knight, Paladin. Level two. Are you already level one in each? Interesting choice. Um, there's a lot of overlap between the Paladin and the fighter. Why do you want to take one or the other? Mm -hmm. I think the Echo Knight is a cooler idea as a feature for an Emerald Dragon with the Roar. Um, if you're looking to just get the Manifest Echo feature, then just a nice three-level dip into Fighter and then going Paladin would be good. It would delay your extra attack. Whatever class option you want to be the primary class, be it Fighter or Paladin, I would take five levels in that first mm -hmm. just to get up to extra attack. Then whatever class you want to dip into and however far you want to dip into it. If you only wanted to dip into Paladin to get the smites and some spells, uh, then just a two, three level dip into Paladin would be fine. If you wanted to just get the manifest echo from the fighter, a two to three level dip in fighter is fine. I think a three level dip into fighter is a lot more beneficial for a Paladin than a three level dip into Paladin is beneficial for a fighter. And then whatever your primary class you want to go with the rest of the way. Yeah. That's how I would do it. It's always it's always a little it's a little wonky to do your multi classing at earlier levels and I'd say three, three to five most of the time. Three, yeah. If you're taking more than for one, if you're taking more than five levels in a class, like you really need to be sure. Um, it's not a dip then it's like a full on I'm two classes at once which mm -hmm. is challenging um, if you're dipping one to three levels in I would wait until you're at least hitting the curve at level four or five uh, three at the earliest like a third level dipping three levels and then taking your fourth and fifth level in your primary class and the rest of the way mm -hmm. can work depending on the class combination for marshals that get extra attack I feel like just bum rushing five levels to get that extra attack as soon as possible is kind of a necessity unless you're a rogue yeah because that's the flow five is when you've changed from tier one to tier two of play um and it, and doing that without extra attack is just very difficult a lot of most classes get a very strong buff at level five yeah. um so yeah you can yeah. not that you can't do it um it can be done it can be done um um so yeah choose your primary Choose your secondary. Let us know how it goes. Please do. Thank you. I'm planning on being an Echo Knight primarily. 
All well right. then, good. Five levels of fighter dip into paladin. Your first level dip into paladin is going to kind of suck because you don't have a whole lot. Uh, second level is when you get your spell casting and divine smite. That's going to be a lot of good value if you're looking just for spell slots specifically to smite. Um, I wouldn't go more than three or four levels into paladin. Get your subclass. Get that subclass feature. Oh, the conquest. I believe it was maybe. Uh, oh, uh, look, look, hold on. Hold on. Uh, yeah, Conqueror. 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 Okay. With a Dragonic Roar feat. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, get that get that subclass feature for the Paladin and then duck out. Keep, I like to keep, I like to duck out at level three for a lot of these classes because in the event that I find that I really, really want a feat, a feat or I really, really need an ASI, that fourth level up in that secondary class is there just to grab it immediately if you really need it. If you find that your multi-classing is a little wonky, you're like, I really need that extra plus one in my charisma, mm-hmm. or I really need that extra plus one in my constitution, but I'm not going to get an ASI in my primary class for another three levels. You can just take it quickly with the one. Once you get marshals, getting two of them at level five, a lot of them have extra attacks, so two extra attacks, it doesn't stack. Yeah, so it's a dead level. It's a dead level. It's a whole thing. All right, well, uh, they say thank you. You are very welcome. You are very welcome. Spring Glen, we'll see you around. Uh, we are clocking in well over two hours. I don't know how much of that I was muted for. Um, Guess we'll find out in post. Rip. I remember I muted myself later to take a drink, and I remember unmuting myself and looking and making sure I was unmuted, and I was unmuted. So it happened after that. Be better. We were well over an hour and a half in at that point, I believe. Well, well over an hour in, at least. So, uh, Rip, if you made it this far, you're the best. Uh, you can find this podcast on YouTube, Apple, Google, Spotify, podcast services around the globe. The cat, as adorable as she has been, has not moved from her spot. She has changed position a couple of times, gotten into some weird looks, but... It's impressive. She's a very active creature. Sadly did not join us for the live today, uh, even though it was requested at the beginning, which is a shame. Um... Thank you. Yeah. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Instagram so you can vote on who had the better candy bar list. And in the meantime, peace. Peace.